Five long years after the release of the last mainline Mortal Kombat game and the release of two spin-offs that made the series seem all but dead, Midway came back in 2002 to release a fully-fledged home console mainline Mortal Kombat game. Packed with a whole bunch of new stages, a shitload of characters, a real progression system through the crypt, an entire conquest mode to allow players to learn whatever character they wanted, an entirely new fighting system with three combat modes for each fighter, brand new graphics that made Mortal Kombat 4 look archaic. This game was essentially an entire overhaul of Mortal Kombat as a series so far. It brought the series into a full new era. At this point, arcades had decayed in popularity so much that Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance didn't even get an arcade cabinet release. Nowadays, I feel as though Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance has sort of been overshadowed by Mortal Kombat Deception and really all the other titles. Many places online I've seen praise Mortal Kombat Deception, but I haven't seen the same love shown to Deadly Alliance. I've personally never even played Deadly Alliance or Deception. The only Mortal Kombat game I've played from this trilogy of PS2 mainline Mortal Kombat games is Armageddon, and I loved it. That game is normally seen as the worst of the three, so who knows, maybe I'll absolutely love this game or I'll feel underwhelmed. All I know is that, clearly, this game was ambitious for its time, and we'll see in this video if they manage to deliver it or not. My name is Steel, and let's get started with talking about how I plan to structure this video. There's a pretty solid amount of content to cover this time around, but to keep the format consistent across all the Mortal Kombat games for the most part, I'm going to talk about the game as follows. I'll play a character in conquest mode talking about how they feel and how they play through that, and then I'll attempt to arcade with three continues. To introduce each character, I'll show the character bio for this game on screen, and then I'll talk about the character, which I've pre-written as I'm playing, and then once I'm done talking about the character, I'll play the character ending. At the end of the video, I'll give an overall opinion on each mode, how far I got into the crypt by experiencing the majority of the content in this game one time, the overall game feel, and my opinion on the overall roster. This one will probably be quite the watch in comparison to some of the other ones, so strap in and enjoy. Mortal Kombat has always been, and always will be. For millennia, the forces of good and evil have been locked in eternal battle over the control of Earthrealm. Some seek to use the tournament to destroy all that is good. Others seek vengeance, power, or eternal life. Time after time, each individual threat has been vanquished, and Earthrealm has enjoyed relative peace for many years. But there is concern that Earth is once again in peril. And this time, the threat of evil has two faces. It is now known that the sorcerer Quan Chi has escaped from the Nether Realm. Since his escape, Quan Chi has unlocked the secret of the ancient Moonstone. Discovered the ancient undefeatable army of the long forgotten Dragon King. And most disturbing of all, formed an alliance with one of our deadliest enemies, Shang Tsung. With their combined strength, they plotted to overpower the only two beings who could prevent their total domination of the two realms. The first was the Emperor of Outworld, Shao Kahn. In a false show of allegiance, they sprung their attack. They then traveled to Earthrealm by way of a mystical portal known only to sorcerers and deities. There, they confronted Earth's mightiest warrior and champion of mortal combat, Liu Kang. It has been Shang Tsung's desire to consume the soul of Earthrealm's greatest warrior. Quan Chi's assistance, he achieved this goal. Liu Kang is dead. They have since returned to Outworld and are using the souls of conquered warriors to resurrect the Dragon King's undefeatable army. Should they succeed, they will have the means to conquer Outworld, and eventually Earthrealm. 
they will be unstoppable. I can no longer stand idly by and watch this evil consume the world. I have relinquished my status as Elder God to return to Earth and lead you all to battle against our old adversaries. We must act now. We must stop this deadly alliance. Shang Tsung Shang Tsung is imprisoned by Shao Kahn, but he was given freedom by Shao Kahn and became youthful by consuming souls. Then Quan Chi returns from the Nether Realm and they team up together. As I'm talking about Shang Tsung, I'm also going to be talking a lot about the game itself since this is my first experience playing it. The conquest mode wasn't too difficult, apart from a couple of combos that felt impossible for a little bit, but I eventually got it. My main issue with conquest, at least for Shang Tsung, is that it's a little bit boring. The only real fight there is the entire time is the 10th mission. The rest of it, it just kind of feels like a tutorial. I do think it's necessary for the game though since this game is far more complicated and varied than previous games in the series. Shang Tsung felt very fun to play. There's so many fucking combos in this game, there's no chance I'll be able to talk about every single one for every character. I can, however, talk about the special moves. Shang Tsung has Soul Steel and Fireball. Soul Steel is pretty cool, it gives you a little bit of health back, and the 3D Fireball is interesting, but not too useful since you have to time it pretty specifically for it to actually hit. I managed to get what I think is pretty far in the arcade, I got to the fight before Moloch. I definitely had the most fun playing as Shang Tsung in this version of the game, rather than any of the other games, because he feels like more of an in-depth character than in the previous games. To be honest, I'm having quite a lot of fun playing this game so far, probably because it feels much different to the previous games, and also since I just finished Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero, which was a pretty big heaping pile of dog shit. Might I also mention how fantastic this game looks in comparison to the previous games in the series. I'm playing on an emulator, PCSX2, which I upscaled to 1080p for the best looking possible experience. The game natively runs in 480p, but upscaled it honestly looks pretty good for its time. It's a 21 year old game, but if you told me that this game was an early PS3 title, then I would believe you. The actual models and stages look really good for their time, including the textures. The Deadly Alliance was successful in reviving the mummified remains of the Dragon King's undefeatable army. Shang Tsung, however, began to realize that his relevance in the partnership had evaporated once his talents for soul transplantation were no longer needed. The balance of power within the Deadly Alliance had seemingly been undone. Fearing betrayal, he secretly instructed Kano to steal Quan Chi's amulet in an attempt to gain control of the army. Since part of the soul transfer spell included the command to obey he who possesses the amulet, the army would obey only Shang Tsung and not Quan Chi once the amulet was in his possession. Amulet in hand, Shang Tsung revealed his betrayal to Quan Chi and commanded the army to destroy the sorcerer. Shang Tsung would succeed where others had failed. He would conquer the realms. He would conquer Earth. Bo Rai Cho Bo Rai Cho had always been in the background training Earthrealm combatants. He even trained Liu Kang. He didn't fight before since he was from Outworld, but now he can fight to save his own realm. I've always known of Bo Rai Cho and about him being goofy, but honestly I never really realized how goofy he was. In conquest mode, I learned that his moves are all pretty silly, even the narrator agreed. A lot of his combos are pretty fun, but the ones that are just normal hits aren't as fun. In arcade, I didn't do as well as I did as Shang Tsung. I think that I prefer Bo Rai Cho as a character for the sheer personality and fun of playing as him, but I'm better at Shang Tsung. His flip flop special move in particular is pretty fun to do. I did his fatality and it was pretty goofy. I died to Kung Lao. Bo Raicho looked gruff, but beamed inwardly. With their victory over the Deadly Alliance complete, he and Kung Lao had liberated Outworld from its latest threat. Despite the years that had passed since training his last student, his skills had proven useful once more. He was elated but it would be inappropriate to express such emotions in front of his newest apprentice. Kung Lao invited his master to return with him to Earthrealm to teach more warriors at the Wuxi Academy. The success of his apprentice gave him renewed confidence in his training skills and, for the first time, a clear purpose in life. Bo Raicho offered only token resistance. 
He accepted the offer because the defenders of Earthrealm could certainly use his help, but more importantly, because Earthrealm's rice wine put Outworld's liquor to shame. Quan Chi. He was being tortured by Scorpion until he stole Shinnok's amulet. After escaping, he discovered the Army of the Dragon King, in which he could revive the entire army if he gets the help of Shang Tsung. I did Conquest Mode really fast with Quan Chi, and he feels overall like an easier character than the previous two. That, or I'm finally actually starting to get the hang of how the combos work in this game and the timing behind them. I actually had a lot of fun in Conquest this time as well. Something new was the Pints of Blood Challenge, which added more gameplay to the Conquest than rather than just training. In Arcade Mode, I also had a lot of fun with Quan Chi, but I really only used his weapon, which is Dual Blades. They're a really good time to use and felt satisfying as hell. I did pretty good, getting to the last fight before Moloch before dying. Scorpion got me. The Deadly Alliance was successful in reviving the mummified remains of the Dragon King's undefeatable army. It would appear that nothing could stand in the way of Shang Tsung and Quan Chi as they began their domination of the realms. Unfortunately for Shang Tsung, however, Quan Chi had no further need for the partnership. Once Shang Tsung had finally revived the last of the mummified warriors, Quan Chi closed the portal to the heavens and effectively shut off Shang Tsung's endless supply of souls. Quan Chi then instructed Kano to assassinate Shang Tsung in a surprise weapon attack. With their captor cut wide open, the thousands of souls Shang Tsung had consumed in the past spewed forth and swirled around the room. Quan Chi came to the realization that if Kano could so easily turn on Shang Tsung, he could also turn on Quan Chi himself. Quan Chi used his sorcery to drain the life from Kano and left his body where it fell. Immediately, one of the lingering souls shot into Kano's body. To Quan Chi's surprise, the man standing before him was no longer the black dragon thug known as Kano. Kino's body now contained the soul of the Shaolin monk, Liu Kang. Li Mei. Enslaved to build a fortress, Quan Chi offered to free her people if she wins the tournament. If she loses, she will be forced to serve the Deadly Alliance forever and her people will not be freed. Conquest mode was pretty boring this time around. Li Mei feels like a nothing character, only here to have boobs. Her moves aren't fun at all to me. Her weapon is underwhelming. I didn't get super far as her, and I'll admit that her cartwheel special move is fun, but other than that, I'm not much of a fan of Lee Mei. Lee Mei had been promised that her people would be freed from enslavement if she could win the tournament held by the Deadly Alliance. Now that she had emerged victorious, the true purpose behind the tournament was finally revealed to her. Her soul would be the last one Shang Tsung needed to completely revive the Dragon King's lost army. Her people would never be freed, and Li Mei herself would remain trapped inside the mummified remains of a dead soldier, cursed to serve the Deadly Alliance forever. Scorpion. Finding out that Sub-Zero didn't defeat his clan, Quan Chi did, they both go to the Nether Realm. Quan Chi escapes and Scorpion follows behind also escaping. He wants to hunt down Quan Chi for good. Honestly, I think I'm just going to stop talking about Conquest until I do a summary of the mode at the end. It's mainly the same for each character, so there's really not much, you know, point in reiterating the same thing over and over again. Scorpion is fun in this game, and he normally is, considering his spear being such a staple. His fighting styles all feel unique and fun, and his sword especially is a lot of fun if you can do some simple combos with it. Scorpion is always a go-to character for new players, and it's evident that it's this way because his moves have always been pretty simple, as are his combos. The hunt for Quan Chi had led Scorpion to the palace of Shang Tsung. Scorpion entered the palace through a hidden passage. As he made his way through the lower levels, he was discovered by the two Oni he had previously encountered while in the Nether Realm. Shang Tsung had secretly allied with Moloch and Draman as a backup defense against Quan Chi. The two Oni had been hidden in an underground chamber and were periodically fed mortals to keep them satisfied. Scorpion fought well, but was overpowered by Moloch and Draman. 
Although they could not consume the ninja specter, they devised another means for eliminating their foe that would satisfy their cruel nature. The Oni brought Scorpion before the portal to the heavens that Shang Tsung had tapped as a source of limitless souls. They hurled him into the Solnado, and his hellspawn body was ripped apart by the purity of that realm. Sonya. Sonya and her team had destroyed all inner realm portals and then realized that the agency's portal chamber had been destroyed as well. Kenshi and Cyrax were lost in Outworld. She met up with Raiden and all she knew was that she had to rescue the two missing agents. I just have to talk about Conquest again for Sonya. The Conquest mode at this point in the game feels so uninspired and pointless. Yes, I'm gonna keep doing it so that I can learn the characters at least a little bit before I actually get into the arcade, but actually going through it is insanely boring. I was fighting to stay awake this time around. Sonya as a character has never really interested me much. She's just a US soldier after all. Her moves are fine, her special move is a toxic kiss, so I guess she just has horrible breath. I'm realizing all the combos in this game are fun to pull off, and that's just an overall game thing and not a character specific thing, so maybe I should stop praising the characters if they have a good combo. In arcade mode, I actually did really good at first, but then I got to Johnny Cage and he absolutely fucked me up so goddamn bad. I passed him, but then Kung Lao didn't even give me a chance. She's not a terrible character, but I'm just biased because I've never really loved playing as Sonya all that much, and her overall design was just never anything that spoke to me. After the destruction of the Deadly Alliance, Sonya searched for the missing Special Forces agent Kenshi. She finally discovered him, badly beaten and near death, apparently from hook-like wounds in his ribcage. She managed to return him to the rendezvous point where I transported them back to Earthrealm. Upon her return, Sonya was promoted to general and given a choice of command. She handpicked a team to deal with new terrorist threats located on Earth, while in Outworld, Special Agent Kenshi had learned of a new threat to peace. The Red Dragon had awakened. Kenshi Kenshi used to just fight people in Japan wanting to be the best until Shang Tsung tricked him and Kenshi unknowingly gave Shang Tsung souls of his ancestors. He vows to kill Shang Tsung. Not even gonna lie, Kenshi is fun as fuck. Mainly he's fun, though, because of his katana. His katana just feels like it has such a good hit, it's so punchy and makes your foe bleed like crazy. The sidestep is just so satisfying to pull off, watching your enemy fly off to the side of the screen. His special moves are all telekinetic powers, which is pretty cool. I like Kenshi as a character in general, I like the mystique he has about him. The game plays well with the fact that he's blind, having him standing looking away from the camera or towards the camera, not really looking at the opponent much, it's a nice little detail. In arcade mode, I was actually shredding. I was doing good as hell up until I got to Kung Lao, who I was so close to defeating but still got killed by. He also used a fatality on me, which poured a whole lot of salt into the wound. Kenshi had finally caught up with Shang Tsung in Outworld. Years ago, Kenshi had been manipulated into releasing the souls of his warrior ancestors. Shang Tsung had consumed those souls and left Kenshi to die in the tomb. The ordeal left Kenshi blinded, but the sword of his ancestors led him out of the depths. To redeem himself, Kenshi had vowed to free his ancestors from their captor. He cut Shang Tsung down with his ancestral sword, and a blast of souls was instantly released. The spirits of the warrior kings re-entered the sword as Kenshi held it above his head. His duty fulfilled, he could now return to Earthrealm. Movado. Movado is in the Red Dragon, a secretive criminal organization. Many members were unhappy in it, so they left and made their own gang, the Black Dragon. The Black Dragon have one last member, Kano, and Shang Tsung and Quan Chi tell Movado that they will hand over Kano if Movado hunts down Kenshi. So Movado's conquest mode is really weird. It's pretty standard up until Mission 7. For Mission 7, you have to fight Sonya, then Mission 8, you fight Jax, then Mission 9, you fight Kenshi, then the mirror match at 10, as always. Just seems weird that it's this way. It makes me feel like Movado as a character is a little half-baked, considering most of the time those missions are spent teaching the player all the various combos of the character, but instead, it's just normal-ass fights that took zero development time to implement. I also kind of noticed that he doesn't have a whole lot of combos in general. Seems a little lazy. Movado as a character feels as standard as they come. He uses hook swords, which Cabal also used. His actual design is whatever. 
I know they need to have another normal person that's against the special forces and in a gang, but it's hard to care about him. In arcade mode, I did fine. I got to Raiden and I was getting fucked, but I passed him. And to be honest, I used way more continues than I originally allowed myself because I'd gotten so far that I didn't want to quit. I ended up getting to Moloch, and before I got too angry, I decided to quit and move on. For many years, Movado's Red Dragon Clan had been secretly engineering the destruction of their rivals, the Black Dragon. Through careful manipulation, Movado had used the special forces to unwittingly aid them in this task. In return for eliminating Kenshi for the deadly alliance, Movado was finally granted his battle with the last known member of the Black Dragon, Kano. After a long, brutal fight, Movado emerged victorious and all traces of the Black Dragon had been erased. Impressed with the fighting skill and discipline of Movado, as well as other members of his clan, Quan Chi realized the potential the Red Dragon held for staging the eventual invasion of Earthrealm. In return for their continued assistance, he offered crucial information about a new threat to Movado's Red Dragon clan, the Lin Kuei. Johnny Cage Johnny Cage was mad at bad writing on his next film, having him die and be resurrected over and over again. Raiden calls him for a meeting. He arrives to the meeting by parachute and then attends the meeting where Raiden tells the group that they need to defeat Shang Tsung and Quan Chi. Johnny Cage is actually pretty fun in this game. Wasn't a big fan of him in many of the games before, but here he's pretty cool. I like how all of his moves are titles after things that have to do with movies or film, like a move called Prequel. I did really good as him in arcade until I got to Kano. If Kano was fight 5 or later, I basically always get my shit rocked by him. His AI just feels really tough in this game. I also really liked how his orb attack wasn't a low orb and a high orb like it had been for the previous few games. I like that it's just one orb again because it just makes it much easier to use. Upset by the way his adventures had been portrayed in the past, Johnny Cage found a loophole in his contract and left MCM Studios during the production of Mortal Kombat, The Death of Johnny Cage. He then used his own money to fund the production of his next movie, which is rumored to be the true story of his latest adventures in Outworld. Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance broke all records in its first weekend in theaters and made Johnny Cage extremely wealthy. The movie told the true story of how Johnny Cage single-handedly saved the world from the threat of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung's deadly alliance. Sub-Zero Sub-Zero defeated Sector and took control over the Lin Kuei clan. He found a nice abandoned arctic temple to set up and train his clan at. Raiden then appeared and asked Sub-Zero to help defeat the Deadly Alliance, and even though it was unusual for a master such as himself to do that, he did it anyways to earn respect from the Lin Kuei. I want to start off by mentioning that this was the first time I actually had some trouble on the mirror match at the end of Conquest. I don't think I lost a single fight to any of the other characters in this mode until now. I lost like three times before finally winning. I thought I was going to do really bad as Sub-Zero, but I ended up doing the best I've ever done in the game so far. I got to Moloch after using only two continues, so I was able to actually get through much of the normal fights without issue. I did kinda use a cheesy method though, I impaled the enemy with the Cory Blade, and then I used the same combo over and over again hoping that their health depletes enough. But hey, if it works, then it works. Sub-Zero was pretty fun, I really like him in this game a lot. He still has his classic Frost Orb as well as some other moves that have to do with Ice. His design is a little weird though, I don't remember him ever being this old in the previous games. After defeating the Deadly Alliance, Sub-Zero returned to the new temple of the Lin Kuei with the severely injured ninja, Frost. A short time later, I visited the temple to commend him for his victory in Outworld and to express my gratitude for all his assistance. With Sub-Zero now the Grand Master of the Lin Kuei, Earthrealm will be well protected. Kano. Kano was defeated by Sonya, and Shao Kahn incarcerated him for it. But when Kano saved Shao Kahn, he promoted Kano to general. He sends Kano to Outworld to get recruits to fight against Earthrealm. Seeing Quan Chi and Shang Tsung fight Shao Kahn, Kano stood aside so he could join the winning side. Once Shao Kahn was defeated, he offered to help the Deadly Alliance. 
The Conquest as Kano was just as stimulating as the other characters in Conquest, meaning it wasn't stimulating at all. Kano has some pretty cool moves, such as his ball move. Something that's kind of weird, though, is that his Kano ball move is called Cannonball now. Which, yeah, it is a Cannonball, but why would they change it? I mean, it's Kano's signature move. It's always been Kano ball. Why is it different now? His laser eye move is fine. His design in this game is great. He looks menacing as fuck, to be honest, and I really like that. He looks consistently and constantly pissed off, and just overall, he looks badass as hell. And honestly, he is pretty badass. He's pretty good in this game, and I still got my shit rocked by Jax anyhow. Kino and Sonya had fought before. Although Kino was humiliated by his defeat at her hands so many years ago, this time the outcome would be different. Kino had stolen Quan Chi's amulet at the request of Shang Tsung. With the amulet in his possession, Kino came to the realization that he was now in total control of the revived undefeatable army. Rather than hand the amulet and the army over to Shang Tsung, Kano kept them for himself and used the army to ambush Sonya, ending their long rivalry once and for all. Well, I'm gonna take a little moment for an intermission. Here we are around the middle of the video. I just want to take a moment to thank everyone who's ever watched and given me the time of day. If you've made it to this point in the video, then I would imagine you're probably enjoying it. So I would really, really highly appreciate it if you sent me a subscribe. I work insanely hard, and this video I worked insanely hard on over the past month, and it would make me very happy if you just showed a little bit of support. Also, I'm currently in college and I'm also working, so if you'd like to help me work a little less and be able to make progress on videos faster, as well as seeing all my new videos a day before they release and some bonus videos, I would be absolutely elated if you considered to become a member. Of course, it is never, ever required to watch any of my content, and it's completely unneeded. I just have it there if anyone wants to do so. Thank you, let's continue with the video now. Kung Lao. Kung Lao found his friend Liu Kang dead. He exacts revenge on Shang Tsung to avenge his friend. He seeks help from Bo Rai Cho, who was more than willing to help train him. Once he's trained, they go to Outworld. Kung Lao was incredibly fun in this game. Him not wearing his hat is kinda weird, but it's fine. I've used his sword again and kept using Impale than just attacking the shit out of my enemy as much as possible and also avoiding their attacks to let my sword take their health away. I got to Moloch and promptly got my ass kicked. I also want to mention how much it pisses me off when I get hit against the edge. The AI yeah, just knows that they can attack me over and over again and I really can't do anything about it and I die so quickly it makes me so mad. Rage fueled Kung Lao's thirst for revenge. The memory of holding his fellow monk's broken body on the Lei Tai of the Wuxi Academy grounds consumed him as he rained blow after blow down upon Shang Tsung. Kung Lao had finally mastered the attack Bo Raicho had taught him. The sorcerer could not withstand his whirlwind assault. Shang Tsung begged for mercy. Kung Lao granted him none. Upon his return to Earthrealm, Kung Lao stood before the modest shrine to Liu Kang, which had been erected by the Wuxi initiates during his absence in Outworld. He lit a stick of incense and placed it among the others already burning there. He bowed his head and prayed for safe passage to the afterlife for his friend and brother. With Shang Tsung's death, Liu Kang's spirit could rest peacefully. Earthrealm was safe once more, but at a terrible cost. The work of the White Lotus Society had become more important than ever. Natara. The vampire Natara discovers the location of an orb, but can't get it herself, so she has reptile help by destroying Cyrex's arm panel, and then she convinces Cyrex to help her find the orb so that she can send him back to Earthrealm, and he does it, but they think they're being watched. I don't like Natara, her design is whatever, but when I'm playing as her the actual game feel sucks. It's hard to pinpoint exactly why, maybe it's the lack of combos that aren't repetitive as fuck or satisfying. I'm not even shitting on her because I'm bad, I actually did the best I ever have when I was playing as her. I defeated Moloch and I moved on to Quan Chi who I won a single round against and then he fucked me up. Natara just doesn't feel like a character that I want to give a shit about or enjoy playing as, she just feels slow and unvaluable to the game. After what seemed like an eternity, Cyrax finally emerged from the lava, holding the orb that had bound Nitara's realm to Outworld for ages. At last it was within her grasp. 
she would be able to free her people from Shao Kahn's imprisonment. Fulfilling her end of the bargain, she sent Cyrax back to his Earthrealm home in exchange for the orb. Nitara stared into the orb. It seethed with the power trapped within. She raised it above her head and then smashed it to the floor. It shattered with an inhuman soul-rending howl. Its horrible energy exploded away and tore her consciousness from her. She awoke later for the first time on her native soil. Draman. He had lived in the Nether Realm for centuries. Quan Chi offers him freedom in return for protecting him from Scorpion. Every time Scorpion tried to attack Quan Chi, Draman and Moloch beat the fuck out of him. Draman led Quan Chi to a place that had a tablet that was similar to Quan Chi's amulet and allowed Quan Chi to leave. He was trying to betray Draman and Moloch, but instead it brought them with to Outworld. I'm going to say it straight up. Draman is fucking nasty. He is quite literally just exposed flesh. Absolutely no skin to be seen on this guy. He has fucking flies hanging around him all the time. One of his moves is throwing a fucking ball of flies. He's constantly bleeding. He has pieces of flesh hanging off of his body. I just know that this man smells absolutely insane. And I fucking love it. Draman's design is super grotesque, but it sticks out. Most characters can kind of blend together without too much to distinguish them for players who are new to Mortal Kombat. Draman does not blend in with everyone else at all. His attacks feel like they hit so goddamn hard every fucking time, and I love it. He just feels so powerful, and the sound effects of his metal club arm connecting with each different enemy just tickles my eardrums and it makes me so horny. He doesn't even have any combos, which is a shame because if he did, I think I would love him even more. But even so, he's a really fun character with a crazy design. Moloch killed me, but before I did that, I did pretty good. Sent by the sorcerer Shang Tsung, the two only known as Draman and Moloch confronted Quan Chi, enraged that he had tried to leave them stranded in the bowels of the Nether Realm. In the battle that ensued, Draman leapt at Quan Chi, and both combatants stumbled into the inner sanctum chamber. Moments later, Draman emerged from the chamber, altered from his previous form. Su Hao. Su Hao, a Red Dragon member, was set to work for the Special Forces to track down the Black Dragon and eliminate them. After it seems the Black Dragon is eliminated, his superior, Mavado, tells Su Hao to destroy the portal that let them travel to Outworld. He gets a bomb and fucking blows it up and goes through the portal himself, looking for Mavado. Fuck Su Hao. He's the goddamn laughingstock of the Mortal Kombat community for good fucking reason. First of all, his design is complete fucking shit. His face looks like a caricature of Jack Black. He has the same fucking thing Kano does for his heart. He's just a general with nothing fucking interesting about him in the slightest. In fucking conquest mode, the mirror match genuinely made me more fucking angry and upset than Goro did back in the first Mortal Kombat video. <laughs> oh my fucking god! Can we not? Oh my fucking god, how? Actually fucking how? Can I move? Can I move? Can I fucking move? Can we- Oh my- Are you actually fucking joking me right now? Holy fucking shit. Stop! Holy shit! Oh. My god. I can't fucking take it anymore. I can't fucking take it anymore. Oh my god! Holy shit! <laughs> oh! I can't catch you! What the fuck? What the fucking fuck? I can't even do anything! I just- Are you fucking me right now? Stop! Stop! I can't- I just- I just- 
I uh oh, whoa. I can't fucking take this shit anymore. <laughs> I can't, I can't! Oh, oh my fucking god! Oh my god, I'm gonna fucking lose my goddamn mind! <laughs> I can't even fucking do anything. I can't even fucking goddamn do anything. I can't. I'm gonna lose my goddamn mind. I'm gonna lose my fucking mind. I can't stop. Stop! Oh my fucking god! Yes! Burn in fucking hell, you goddamn cocksucker. Fuck you. Oh my god. Yes, fucking eat a goddamn bowl of my penis flakes, you fucking piece of shit, cock-sucking bitch. Fuck you. In arcade, I got six wins in a row and then lost to Kung Lao. I just, I really can't stand this goddamn character at all. Fuck Su Hao. Su Hao reported to his superior, Movado, and informed him of his success in destroying the Special Forces Outer World Investigation Agency. Movado then informed Su Hao of his next objective, it seemed that Quan Chi was proving to be a powerful ally and was willing to aid the Red Dragon in its quest for domination of Earth. In a show of good faith, Mabato agreed to destroy Quan Chi's enemies. The sorcerer suspected betrayal from Shang Tsung. There was evidence that Shang Tsung had allied with the two Oni, known as Moloch and Ramen. Su Hao's new orders were to eliminate the sorcerer Shang Tsung before the Oni eliminated Quan Chi. Frost. Since Sub-Zero was reforming the Lin Kuei clan, he had a tournament to recruit the best of the best. Frost won. Sub-Zero goes out of his way to personally train her. She got arrogant. Uh, Sub-Zero goes to Outworld and brings along Frost. Sub-Zero doesn't know it, but Frost has ulterior motives. Frost is kind of a lame excuse for a new character. She takes Sub-Zero's slide move and then has the Frost move that just makes a line on the ground which freezes, but it essentially works the same as the orb that Sub-Zero has. She's not very interesting design-wise either. She's basically Sub-Zero with boobs and ice for hair. Really nothing to write home about. This is the last new character in this game, so I'm going to mention something about the new characters as a whole. They're totally hit or miss. Either very memorable and cool, or totally forgettable and pointless. This one falls under the totally forgettable and pointless. As they traveled back to the portal that would return them to Earthrealm, Sub-Zero revealed to Frost that she had been an integral part in the destruction of the Deadly Alliance and that he was proud to have her as a member of the Lin Kuei clan. But unknown to Sub-Zero, Frost's true intention for joining the Lin Kuei was to become Grand Master herself. She used her Ice Blast to temporarily immobilize him and rip the Dragon Medallion from his chest. As she held the medallion, she felt power surge through her body. Lacking the strength and discipline required to control the medallion's immense power, she was consumed by her own freezing ability. Jax. Pretty much same shit as Sonya, works for the Outworld Agency, sends Cyrex and Kenshi to Outworld, realizes Outworld is a threat. Su Hao destroys the power, so Jax almost dies, Raiden takes him to Outworld, and he tries to hunt down Su Hao, which is absolutely awesome. I really like how powerful Jax feels in this game. His voice lines, however, do feel like a bit much at times. I hear, "Oh yeah, constantly, over and over again since I used his gun quite a lot. His quick punch move thing feels great. His conquest mode was really weirdly short though, I mean I did it in less than 10 minutes, it was weird. His design is fine, I don't know, overall pretty standard character in the game, but hey, I did beat the arcade mode as him using only two continues, so that felt pretty good. And also, his ending happened to be him fucking killing Su Hao, which is fucking awesome. Did I just beat the game? I'm moving my mic down. I might have just beat the game. I don't know though. I, I think that's it. I think I just beat the arcade, which is cool, because then I don't have to go back and try again. Yeah, champion. Look at them, they dead as hell. Yeah. I mean, I'm not that hyped, because, I don't know, I've done so much conquest and everything. Sick. 
Jax had a score to settle with the traitor he knew as Su Hao. Now revealed to be a member of the Red Dragon, Su Hao had infiltrated the Special Forces Outer World Investigation Agency and destroyed it with a miniature nuclear weapon. Making good on his promise, Jax eventually caught up with Su Hao and ripped the implant from his chest in retribution. Su Hao died a most painful death. Katana. She freed Edenia from Shao Kahn and Goro died. Fortunately, Shao Kahn died from someone unknown, but it still sucks because Goro was dead and the whole army is left without a leader. Undead soldiers started to appear that were commanded by Quan Chi and Shang Tsung, so she must fight to save her realm again. Kitana's longtime enemy Shao Kahn was dead, and the alliance between Shang Tsung and Quan Chi was defeated with the help of warriors from Earthrealm. Although there was peace once more throughout the realms, all was not right for Kitana. Saddened by the death of Goro, she attended a ceremony in the Kuotan Palace to honor her fallen friend and ally. Following Shokan tradition, Prince Goro's body was lowered into the molten rock contained within the throne room itself. As Kitana said goodbye to her wartime ally, she also held a moment of silence for Liu Kang, and secretly wished he had joined her in Edenia so many years ago. Raiden all of the Elder Gods decided to not interfere with the Deadly Alliance, except Raiden. He relinquished his Elder God status and went to Earth to get support. He gathered up a whole bunch of people to team together in battle against Outworld, and then sent them all to Outworld to fight. Raiden has always kind of been whatever to me, but I actually really like his moveset in this game. His grab that electrocutes is satisfying, all the different sweeps he does with his staff are really satisfying, his lightning bolt is nice as it always is, uh, his charge move is fun as well. I really like his design in this game too, with electricity fully just going through his body and pulsating all over him, which I know was present in other games, but in this game something about it just hits different. In arcade I did pretty good, I didn't lose a single round until the fight before Moloch, and then Moloch killed me. Once again, the threat to Earthrealm has been vanquished. The deadly alliance is no more. What dangers lie in the future I can no longer foresee. Perhaps the Dragon King will in fact return. Perhaps the depths of the Nether Realm will spew forth a legion of Oni. Even the vampire people pose a threat to peace now that Outworld is in chaos. But one thing is certain Earthrealm must be protected. I have abandoned my status as Elder God to aid these mortals and act defiant of the heavens. I will instead remain here on Earth as God of Thunder. Reptile. He found out Shang Tsung and Quan Chi were trying to kill his master, Shao Kahn, but when he was on his way to tell Shao Kahn, he gets stopped by Natara, who helped find a hidden base camp controlled by Katana. He found Shao Kahn dead when he returned. He wandered Outworld very sad and disappointed until he found Natara again, and he offered his loyalty to her. That's when he goes to attack Cyrax. Listen, I'm all for changing up a character's appearance as the series goes on. It can keep the game fresh and interesting trying to figure out what the next evolution of a character is. I think that in concept, having Reptile actually morph into a reptile-like creature is cool. However, he looked fucking stupid in Mortal Kombat 4, and in this game, that didn't change. He still looks stupid. He's so close to looking badass, but he just doesn't. I had trouble again at the end of his Conquest mode. Despite me having trouble at the end of Conquest mode, I straight up beat the game again, and this time I only used one continue. It was really a legendary run, because throughout this video I've been in need of Cyrax, the last character on the roster. To unlock him, I need to use Platinum Coins, which you can only get from Test Your Sight and Test Your Might minigames, which only happen every once in a while after a few fights. Luckily, I was able to do the last Test Your Might I needed on this run, as well as beating the whole game, so that was cool. Despite the strong sulfur stench that filled the chamber, Reptile could smell that Natara and Cyrax had been there recently. 
There was no sign of them now, except for some scattered glass shards and a residual trace of strong magical energies. His revenge would have to wait. Suddenly, an expectant hush filled the chamber as energy cascaded around what appeared to be a dragon embryo. The tiny dragon stretched and the egg cracked. A beam of energy ripped out from inside and lanced into reptile. His world was filled with a roaring power as his squamous body was twisted and transformed. The ancient prophecy had been fulfilled. The Dragon King had returned. Cyrax. He got his soul back with the help of Jax and Sonya. He joined the Special Forces and was sent to Earthrealm. He got attacked by a reptile and lost his navigation system. Natara offered to help and he took the offer but doesn't fully trust her. Cyrax is as fun as ever in this game. I had a really good time playing as him. His saw ability is super fun, his bomb makes the sound that gets me off, his weapon impales. I beat the conquest now, officially, and as a reward I get two more characters to play as, as if this video wasn't long enough already. The enormous heat and pressure of the lava burned out Cyrax's sensors almost immediately. He cast about blindly in the infernal pit, searching for the orb Nitara had sent him to locate. Cyrax found it resting upon a small submerged pedestal beneath the molten depths. As soon as he climbed her to the surface, she demanded he hand over the orb. Nitara had promised to return Cyrax to Earthrealm once the orb had been retrieved. Taking her necklace in hand, she uttered a mystical incantation. A swirling portal opened around Cyrax had he only had time for a solemn bow before he was swept into the gateway. Blaze. He's a mysterious elemental who got ambushed on his bridge, which is the background of the pit back in Mortal Kombat 2, and is forced to protect the last known dragon egg. Well, to be honest, it's cool that he's here, but his moves are lame. It's just reused moves and fight styles that other characters already have. It's whatever, but eh. It kind of made me realize how important conquest mode is because I got my ship fucked up by fight three. Having been enslaved through sorcery to guard the molten incubation chamber, Blaze was finally freed once the dragon egg had hatched. He then resumed the quest he had undertaken before being subdued by his captors. He was a martial arts teacher in Chicago. Johnny Cage called him to help with uh, Johnny Cage's movie, uh, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. Same story as Blaze, just reused fight styles and combos. In fact, Blaze and Mocap share the same special moves. Kinda lame. Mocap Man was the primary martial arts talent for motion capture during the production of Johnny Cage's movie based on recent events in Outworld. He was referred to the game designers at Midway Games and used in the production of the video game adaptation of the movie. The End Now that I've finished the game, I gotta say, it does feel really good to be done after playing this game for so long. I'm gonna talk about some aspects of the game now in a general sense. Stages even though stages have never been absolutely integral to the gameplay in Mortal Kombat, I really like the stages that are in this game. A lot of them really feel full of life and fleshed out. A lot of nice background features that keep it stimulating. There's obstacles in the way that can do damage on some stages, and some stages that have hazards like acid, and overall I think the stages in this game are the best so far in the series. Of course, the original trilogy will remain forever iconic and probably have the most iconic stages in the whole series, but I really like the stages in this game so far. Roster. Well, the roster in this game is probably one of the weaker aspects. It's not horrible, really most of the mainstays are here and they're fine, but the new characters really aren't all that much. I like Dramin, but I don't know, he's not exactly a favorite among the community. And of course, it introduced Su Hao, the worst fucking video game character to ever lay its bad will upon a beloved franchise. The fact that you have to unlock them in the crypt is fine, but it does feel kind of like it pads out the game, which I'll talk about later on. Fighting. The actual core of this game, the fighting, feels really good in this game. It feels great. The combos feel so nice and smooth and they just glide across each other so well. Every character has a combo that at least feels nice. The three fighting styles for each character feels unique and fun. 
The weapons feel less gimmicky in this game than they did back in Mortal Kombat 4. It adds a lot of variety and variability to the gameplay, and I like that. There are some styles that have really similar styles to other characters, but it's hard to fault the game for that when fighting styles didn't exist in the series at all until now. Everyone used to just have the same four basic moves without any variety except some combos and special attacks. Overall, the fighting in this game is just fantastic. It feels great. Conquest. I hate to say it, but Conquest mode kinda sucks. Yeah, it's good for new players for training for sure. It definitely helped me get a grasp on the fighting styles concept quickly, and it allowed me to experience every character and get used to each character a little, and maybe memorize a couple combos before I jumped headfirst into arcade. But it wasn't any fun at all. There also was little challenge, apart from the mirror match at the end. It just showed buttons on a screen and you had to press them in succession and boom, you're good to go. Sometimes I just went on autopilot during it and ended up not remembering anything because it just felt too easy and brainless. Each character doesn't need to have their own 10 missions. It just feels like padding out game time at a point. I got bored of Conquest after I did the first character. The actual reward for it is Blaze and Mocap, which is fine I guess, but neither of them have anything unique so it doesn't really make it feel like it was worth the grind. Conquest just kind of feels underwhelming and tacked on. Crypt. This game is the first game in the Mortal Kombat series to contain the Crypt. The Crypt is essentially just a whole bunch of bonus shit that you unlock as you earn currency. Something worth mentioning is that there are six different types of currency, which is kind of weird. You can only get Onyx and Platinum from Test Your Sight and Test Your Sight, which makes it horrible to grind out. If you want gold, you can get fucked and just get Ruby and Sapphire and Jade over and over again in matches. I'd rather it all just be one currency, but whatever. The Crypt is also huge, which is cool for replayability's sake, but... Also, a lot of it has shit like hints to coffins that you actually want, and pieces of a comic strip and pictures of old game logos, which just doesn't feel necessary. There's also some really cool shit though, like random drawings of characters doing weird shit or parodies or early gameplay videos. I think it could have been smaller and just had the cool shit, but whatever, I still think the crypt is cool and overall a net positive. Overall content. Okay, so let's be real. This game puts on a facade of having a shitload of content when it really is just tedious and repetitive. A lot of characters feel really similar to each other and operate the same way. The Acid Spit of Reptile, the Fireball of Shang Tsung, the Blood Spit of Natara, the Orb of Johnny Cage, the Spark of Li Mei, the Hat of Kung Lao, and many I'm sure I'm missing. It's all really just the same move but with a different skin. A lot of combos are super similar and samey. Conquest is the same shit over and over again with different characters. It's a training mode disguised as a campaign with challenges for missions when it's not. They're not challenging. The music in Conquest is the same all the time, which gets really grating. The Crypt is cool, but a lot of it is just fluff that I don't think most people really care about. The gameplay is fun, and it... don't get me wrong, I mean, you know, the gameplay is the core of the game, it's very important that it's good, and it is, but it does get stale after playing the game as much as I did, and there's a lot of content here, and I, I'm sure there are people out there that don't mind the repetitive nature of it, you know, to each their own. Uh, despite having three fight styles for every character, there are still many characters that just kind of feel the same. But, you know, I think that the game was definitely meant more so to be played over the span of many years as they were waiting for the next Mortal Kombat game and not grind it out like crazy to do it as fast as I could. But, you know, here we are now. So, what do I think of the game overall? I think it's a good game. I'd even go as far to say it's the best in the series up to this point. It can be really fun and challenging at points, and that's great. I just think it's meant to be enjoyed more passively, and not grinded the way that I grinded it. Yeah, there's a lot of repetitive content and gameplay, but the core gameplay is fun and still arcadey with the right amount of blood and gore. Oh yeah, and best fatalities in the series so far. I'm gonna go ahead and give it a 7.5. I think it's really good, it just it feels like it has some big faults that I can't really ignore. If you'd like to see more about the crypt and also just hear me ramble on about starting YouTube and just other random bullshit, then keep watching, but if not, thank you for watching and thanks to all the people who've subscribed and helped grow this community. I just, I really want to let you guys know that we're just getting started and uh, I'm really excited to see what the future holds. Here's a long ass clip of me rambling now. First of all, thank you for watching this far. I'm not really going to edit any of this part. This is just kind of bonus. Uh, for whoever wants to watch it, so I'm gonna click on Conquest. I haven't even clicked on it since I uh, finished beating Conquest on every character, so I'm not even sure. Yeah, you've completed all available missions. If you wish, you could reset your Conquest mode progress now. You will lose any current progress, but you'll be able to complete missions again for more currency. Do you wish to reset your progress? No. I just kind of want to look at the screen that shows everyone being red because it uh, it feels good knowing that I did it. Oh! Oh, okay, I guess I can't even... I can't even look at it. That's kind of shitty. Okay. For sure. Alright, well, anyway. Um, let's look at the crypt. So, 
I uh, pretty much everything that you're gonna see is what I unlocked up to. I think Mavado. That's when I unlocked every character except Cyrax, who I didn't unlock until almost the very end. So all the currency that I racked up um, is since playing as Mavado. So I got through a good a good portion. I can't even buy that one. That's funny. I've just been kind of buying them in order. Um, so I guess I'll buy this one. So this is just to kind of show uh, what it's like in the crypt, you know. Let's see. Wow, Mavado Coat Concepts. So there's just like a lot of little bonus things, which is which is cool. Gonna unlock this one. I'm just you know this might this might be a little long because I'm literally just gonna unlock as much as I can with the currency that I have left uh, to show how much you can uh, you can I guess really get uh, by just kind of seeing what the game has to offer once. So really, I mean, this game has a lot of replayability, but. Also, not really. I mean, it, it has replayability, but it feels kind of like padding because, I mean, there's so many coffins. It's a uh, 26 times 26, which is, I don't know, like 500 something. So I, I, uh, I guess 526. I don't know, some shit like that. And I really don't feel like grinding for uh, for all this shit would be worth it. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's other than the characters, which I obviously looked up. I didn't just randomly guess. Um, you know, it's shit like this, Swampland sketch. Like, I, you know, I, I don't need a grind to see a whole bunch of shit like that. Uh, I, I mean, it's cool the developer has it here, and it, you know, it's it's definitely like a you know a bonus for someone who was playing the game when it first came out, and they're just enjoying it like with friends or by themselves or you know what have you. Uh, and it's not really meant to be something that you grind out while you're what the hell? I don't even know what that is. Uh, while you're trying to, um, you know, make a YouTube video or a review or what, whatever. You know, it's not something that they designed to uh, actually be completed purposefully in a short amount of time. It's uh, it's more so just bonus. I mean, you know, none of this shit is required except for the characters. Um, and it's, it's kind of silly that it's that way. I think it would be nice if it was highlighted that way because I had to look it up. I mean, I, I get it. That also adds replayability for the people that want to, like, you know, unlock every character. So, you know, they're going to have to go through a hell of a lot of random-ass coffins that have shit they don't want in them before they actually get to the characters. Which is a little silly because, you know, I mean, that's... I just... <laughs> hint? FK, fly killer. Okay. I unlocked a hint from a coffin. That's weird. I didn't even know that was a thing. Um... So, you know, I think I think that, you know, overall it's a net positive, but at the same time, they could have they could have made the characters' coffins a little bit more conspicuous. You know, maybe themed the coffin after the character that you're unlocking or something. Just because I feel like for the majority of players who played this game back in the day that didn't have access to internet, which, you know, a large percentage of people didn't at the time, uh, you know, I think for those players... It was probably horrible trying to find exactly which coffins had characters because there's just there's so many coffins and some of the characters are like really far down the line like uh, you know I'll scroll through and I'll maybe I'll try to find one that's like way down the line that I looked up like I didn't just unlock naturally because I didn't really unlock anything naturally past the point that I'm at right now like everything that I'm unlocking now is natural but the shit that I you know I didn't cheat for any coins I, I mean natural as in like didn't look it up to figure out which coffins I should open for characters. I mean, I only did that because, um, you know, I mean, if I'm doing a video on the game, I kind of want to be able to experience everything the game has to offer. Um, and also, it's kind of like a personal thing. Uh, you know, like, I want to feel like I've completed a game. Like, I, I want to feel like I don't need to ever come back to it, and I'm okay with that. Um, not that I don't ever come back to games I've already completed, um... You know, I, I think it's it, it's great to, to do that. Um, there's a lot of games that I've, I've come back to after beating. I mean, but there's also other games where it's like, ah, you know, like, I I mean, it's, there's so many Mortal Kombat games out there. It's like, there's not really, you know, I didn't grow up with this game. Um, it, it's, it's not one of those games that I can see myself really coming back to anytime soon. Um, 
And I did buy a physical copy of the game, but I haven't even played it, so I guess I don't know if it works. I bought it off of eBay, which I do for all the games I play for my videos, just because, you know, I want to have the actual physical game in my collection, even if I'm playing it on an emulator. Uh, and then it makes it feel more real. But, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, if... And this is something that kind of fucks me up when it comes to, like, completing games on an emulator, is that if something were to ever happen to my computer's hard drive, or even if I build a new computer, which will happen eventually, um probably sooner rather than later to be honest and it's like you know whenever i do that i'll probably get a new drive and uh, you know am i really going to take the time to transfer my data from mortal Kombat deadly alliance no i'm probably not i mean you know it's not safe to a cloud and uh you know hard drive failures happen uh which is my worst nightmare that would be terrible because i have uh, a lot of videos shit and uh, music shit that i've worked on and uh, if i lost everything that would really suck uh because, you know, I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, creating a lot of different content, and um, I don't want that to just kind of disappear forever. Um, and, you know, of course, progress, like, on shit like this. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, I understand that's going to happen at some point. And also, that's, that's also part of why I don't want to, you know, grind for every coffin. Because if I did that, and then I lost all my progress, I, you know, it would just be a big, fat time sink. And, you know, I don't want to do that. And, you know, shit like this, too. Empty coffin. Come on. Like, I just spent 258 Onyx coins, which is... Onyx and Platinum coins are the most annoying to get because you have to do test your miter, test your sight, which you only get, I think, every five fights, um, which I didn't look up, but I kind of figured that out from playing. So it's like every five fights you get a chance to win some Onyx or Platinum coins. And it's like, that's kind of fucked because, you know, if you're... <laughs> if... If you grind so much for, you know, the Onyx coins or whatever, the Platinum coins, and then you open a coffin just for it to be empty, it's like, what the fuck? You know, that's kind of, it's kind of fucked. Because, you know, no, no one wants that to happen after grinding. And also, I, I want to say, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, you know, you see how long this is taking right now? I mean, this, this segment's already about five minutes long, and I haven't really gotten through much of opening all these fucking things. And a lot of them are videos. I, I mean, at the end of this, you know, segment, oh, cool. Um, I'm gonna look up, or not look up, I'm gonna go to, uh, the, the different shit that I can look at that I've unlocked in the crypt. It's, uh, I forget the name of the, oh, I unlocked a, an arena? I honestly, that's actually crazy. Okay, so here we are right now. I've already beaten the game. I've already done everything I need to do. Right now, it is 1.20 a.m. on Wednesday, August 16th, 2023. I have completed the game. And I'm just now finding out that you can unlock new arenas from the crypt. I didn't even know that. Um, I already have most of the video edited and done. I, I just... <laughs> that's crazy. I can't believe that I just figured that out. If I had known that, I would have also went for the for the arenas. But I'm not going to do that now because... I mean, what the fuck? I mean, I'm already, I've already done the game. And uh, I'm trying to get the, this video out on Thursday. Which, you know, by the time you're watching this, it's probably, you know... Well, it's definitely past Thursday or on Thursday if you're watching this, but, you know, I think that's, uh, that's kind of fucked. I, I genuinely didn't know that, so I guess that's another thing that, you know, gives value to the crypt is, uh, arenas. You can unlock new, new arenas. Wow, 18 jade coins for, uh, 264 sapphire coins. But anyway, my point was, uh, before I saw the stage, the, the animation is really long. It doesn't feel like it needs to be this long. I feel like I could just double click on something. It doesn't have to do this animation every time. Like, whoa, I got a costume for Johnny Cage. I'm gonna come, you know, like, I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, it auto saves every single time, saving successful. And then here's the little animation of it opening. It's like, I don't need all that. Like, how about just save whenever I leave the crypt? You know, I mean, uh, Quan Chi on the sacks, that's, okay. I'm trying not to, like, look at them like crazy because I kind of want to just, you know, showcase them at the end. And uh, if I've already seen everything, then it's really not, it's not going to be, I'm not going to be able to put a whole lot of input on, uh, on each individual piece of extra bonus content. Which really, at the end of the day, I mean, I guess, I guess the arenas aren't really required. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, it, it, I guess it kind of adds gameplay if it has, um, you know, like the one that has, like, the acid vats that spit out acid every once in a while, you know. Or, you know, stage fatalities. You know, you know that, that adds some element of gameplay, but, you know, it's also Mortal Kombat. And, and like, the stage, you know, 
world. For the most part, it's just kind of background. You know, it's not there. You know, it's not a different map in a video game. You know, it's not. A, you know, it's not an open world game. It's. I don't know how to explain it. I mean, it's it, it's really just background. It, it doesn't really add anything different to the gameplay unless there's, a, I guess, a stage fatality or acid or whatever. So I think I'll sleep okay knowing that I, I probably missed out on a few stages. I think uh, I think I'll be okay. Um, and and also, honestly, I don't think that would change my rating at all because I don't have any problem with the arenas. I think the arenas in this game are the best. <laughs> Ed Boon. I think... Um, I think that the stages in this game are the best that the series has seen up to this point, up to Mortal Kombat 5, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. Um, you know, they, they have a lot of detail. They, you know, they look very different. You know, it's, uh, I, I think obviously, you know, the older ones, uh, 1, 2, and 3, the original trilogy probably has the most iconic, but uh, I actually really like the ones in this game. I think they're, they're really cool. You know, I, quality assurance Chicago. That's funny. You know, at this point, I'm just kind of fucking blabbing because, I mean, look at this shit. I still have 13,000 jade coins left. I, I mean, this is, you know, it just seems excessive. I'm only on E. Like, imagine if I had enough currency to unlock every single coffin. Like, I'd, I'd be sitting here for, for hours. Um, and, and I think that's kind of crazy. I feel like I feel like it shouldn't it shouldn't be this this drawn out. I guess maybe the average person isn't doing it like this and they're just doing it after every fight or something. Which, if they're doing that, then... They're not every fight, but, you know, every run-through of the arcade or, you know, every character they do on Conquest. Maybe they're coming back and unlocking whatever they can or whatever the hell, but... I don't know if, if everyone did that. I, I, you know, it, it's interesting to think about the fact that this game came out 21 years ago. Uh, you know, this game can legally drink, and... You know, the game is older than me, because I'm, I'm 19, born in 2004. And, um... It's interesting because... Whenever I look at Mortal Kombat 4 in comparison to Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, I'm like, you know, holy shit, that, that is quite the generational leap. I mean, like I said at the, in the intro of this video, I mean, this could be an early PS3 game, and I believe it. Because it, it, it's really, it, it's pretty good looking, like 4 and really a, you know, semi-early PS2 game. Like, it, it looks pretty damn good, especially for, you know, 2002. Um, and... It really just in general, I mean, the, the whole idea of, like, you know, currency and unlocking different things and, you know, all these bonus features really became a thing at this time, you know, when disc media was becoming popular where, you know, they could fit a whole bunch of random bullshit like this. You know, back in the original games where there's cartridges, you know, they can't really fit a fucking bonus video on there, you know, there's not enough storage for that. But on a fucking CD, a DVD, you know, hell yeah, you can fit a, you know, a whole bunch of extra shit. Um... And it's interesting to see, you know, I, something about Mortal Kombat X that I really liked a lot was the crypt. And same thing with Mortal Kombat 9. Uh, I played a hell of a lot more X than I did 9 because, you know, I was older whenever X came out. Um, and, you know, something I really liked about that was the fact that there was just, like, nice bonus content. That It's not required, but it's, like, you know, something to work towards. And, I, you know, I get off it on progression. And that's probably why I like Mortal Kombat X a lot is because... You know, there's a level up system, and there's progression, and there's you know the crypt, and it's it's like every little thing, you know, I can fucking fart while playing the game, and it's gonna help me progress, and that's awesome. Uh, I, I love games, you know, giving me that dopamine hit whenever I do literally anything. Um, and it's it's interesting to see how the crypt has evolved over the years. I mean, it started in this game, and uh, you know, Mortal Kombat 11's crypt is like a whole nother game, really, and I think. That has probably gotten better, but at the end of the day, I keep saying the same shit. You know, I, I talk a lot. I mean, this has been, it's been like 10 minutes of me just fucking blabbing. Uh, I have 666 Ruby Coins, FW. wonder what this is. It's all lit up. I guess just under the light. Probably nothing special. Uh, okay. UH, Unleash Hell. You know, I, I, I'm probably running in circles and shit. You know, this is why I don't do a podcast is because I just can't talk. FU, it's probably going to be like a jump scare F you. It's totally going to be an empty coffin. There's no way. Yep, I knew it. I fucking knew it. That's so funny. Um, damn, I really can't stay on one subject. Uh, Christ, I don't even know where I was at, to be honest. I, I straight up just be, be blabbing. Oh, yeah, the crypt. Well, something about this crypt is really, like, eerie and foreboding, and I like that. And also, I know there's a jump scare somewhere in here. I don't know where. 
but I know there is one. Um, I think I saw it a long time ago, but I don't I don't remember it. So I'm kind of mentally preparing myself to get jump scared, but you know I'm also just like you know blabbing. So I guess if I do get jump scared, it probably won't be that bad because you know I'm not like watching it intently, silently, or anything like that. You know, uh, I also just want to say, th again, thanks. If you're watching this right now, that's crazy. Because I don't know what entertainment value you're getting out of this. Um, but I, I really just... I know I need a new mic, by the way. You know, I know there's going to be comments on this video that are going to be telling me I need a new mic. I'm very well aware. Uh, if I want, like, a... Wow, I just got more Jade coins. Are you shitting me? The thing is, though, if I get a new mic, uh, you know, it costs a lot of money. And, uh... You know, I'm not Mr. Moneybags or anything. I, I, I don't really be making a crazy amount of money. Um, so, you know, it's kind of hard to to be able to get the money together for that, even though I know that's something that's very important, and I'm hoping to, to get a new one soon-ish. Um, but God, I just... Wow, this is taking way longer than I thought it would, to be honest. I mean, I was, I've been thinking, like, the whole time playing, I was like, ah, you know, at the end, it's just going to be chill. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the crypt and Mortal Kombat and whatever uh, while opening coffins. And I, I just didn't think it'd go on this long. Like, I've kind of, I'm sure there's different things that I was talking about that I just totally trailed off of and forgot about that I could expand upon, but I didn't. And um, so now I'm at this point where I'm really just totally blabbing. I, I don't even have anything else to say. But um, I still really want to show this, uh, and I don't know. I, I guess I kind of want to, I kind of want to talk to you guys because really, I mean, all my videos are are scripted. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. I'm not just saying how we think off the cuff, um, and I kind of want to get to know my audience a little bit better. Uh, I think it's it, it's it's crazy for for anybody that's watching this that you know hasn't seen any of my other videos. Uh, I literally, I, I started YouTube in early 2022. Well, no, that's not true. I started YouTube in late 2013 when I was the ripe age of nine. I was nine years old because I really, really wanted to be a YouTuber back then. Um, still do. I mean, obviously, I'm still doing it. But, you know, back then it was it was different. I was just kind of doing whatever and I guess hoping. I didn't edit, didn't do whatever. But in late 2021, towards the end of the year, I was, it's, you know, senior year of high school, and I was thinking in my head, like, damn, you know, I'd, I'd really like to try YouTube again because I, I'm still really passionate about it. Like, I, I'd stopped doing it for a few years, and I'd never really put full effort, like, editing behind it. I'd taken a couple editing classes at this point, or at that point, so I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit. And I knew it would take a lot of time, and it'd be a lot more work than I've ever done, but... For, for YouTube, but, you know, I, I, I'm really passionate about it, so I wanted to do it anyway. So I did it, and I was like, all right, well, I'm going to upload weekly, and I'm going to do that for all of 2022. Well, I got to May, uh, and I uploaded a video that got, like, six views in, like, two weeks. And I was like, all right, well, you know, I, I was going to continue making videos, but I missed a week on accident, and I just didn't upload again up until, uh, I think it was April, that I uploaded a Far Cry video, which I actually pretty much played all in December of 2022. Um, you know, I was just busy. I, I, you know, I was starting college. I was, um, I guess, worried about coming back to YouTube because of the time sink and because, you know, I didn't want to waste the time if, you know, there was there was no audience. Um, it's not that I, I didn't think I was capable necessarily. It's just, you know, the algorithm is a big part in um, doing anything on YouTube. But then in, um, you know, after I did the Far Cry video, it got like 100 views in the first, you know, two days or something. And I was I was hyped. I mean, that's like the, the most any of my videos at that point had, had gotten in such a short time. And I got a few comments and people being nice. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's cool. You know, I'm glad that happened. But I was still, you know, it was around finals for uh, my freshman year of college. So I was like, ah, you know, and this is this year, by the way, April this year. And I was just, you know, doing that. And then Mortal Kombat uh, 1 was announced, and um, I was like, huh, well, you know, I've always wanted to go back to the first actual Mortal Kombat game, and, uh, you know, I'm like, ah, you know, while I'm at it, if I'm going to play through it, I might as well do a video, you know, fuck it. And little did I know that would be 
you know, and and actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to tell something that happened before this. So actually, towards the end of April and early May, I just remembered this. I was working on a video because if you look back at my channel, there's, you know, videos where I'm talking about different albums and also videos where I'm talking about games. So I kind of wanted to do like, you know, mixed videos. And so I was making a video on Bastard by Tyler the Creator. Um, that album. And I'd spent probably like six or seven hours editing it and gathering footage and I'd already scripted it and I'd listened to the album like ten times to talk about it. And like I was working really hard on that video. I really wanted to, to make a good video. And then the file uh, just disappeared off my computer. I couldn't find it anywhere. It was just gone. Straight up gone. And uh, I was really upset about that. And uh, because that happened, I ended up making the first Mortal Kombat video because Mortal Kombat 1 was announced and I wanted to play it, so I just did it. And it's it's funny looking back on it now because had that not happened and that file been lost, which was heartbreaking in the moment, had that not happened, then I wouldn't have any audience now. And it's it's insane to me because it's only been about... It's been less than three months since I uploaded the first Mortal Kombat video. And I was absolutely elated when it got a 1,000 views in like three days. And then... You know, a month and a half later, when I uploaded the Mortal Kombat 4 video, it got something like 60,000 views in the first, um, in the first, like, five days. And, and that's insane to me. Um, and I, I really just can't believe that, um, really anything is coming of this sort of YouTube dream that I've had for my entire life. Uh, you know, at least over half of my life since I was nine. And, um... I, I, I'm really genuinely, I, I feel like I don't say it enough or, um, or something. Or I, maybe I don't come off as, you know, genuine because whenever I'm saying it, it's scripted. But, you know, this isn't scripted, obviously. Um, I just want to say, like, seriously, uh, thank you to every single person who has clicked on any of my videos and giving me, given me the time of day at all. Uh, it, it really, it means so much to me. I, I'm so lucky right now to be in the position I'm in. And I know it's not like, you know, some some crazy, you know, you know, I'm not fucking PewDiePie, but I, I think that it's, um, it's just in, in, incredible. I'm, I'm very lucky and um, I'm, I'm very, very thankful for, uh, for each and every person that, you know, comments and uh, says nice things and, you know, subscribes and likes the videos and everything. It, it really... It gives me hope for the future. It makes me feel like, you know, my dream's coming true. And that is uh, just, it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling that people even care. And it, it's not even like a self-deprecating thing. Because, you know, I, I know that there are hundreds, you know, of YouTubers out there. YouTubers that make, you know, Mortal Kombat videos. Or YouTubers that make uh, video game videos in general or whatever. That have content that is... Ten times better than mine. I mean, I and I like I said, I don't mean that in a self-deprecating way. I mean that in a legitimate way. They're just simply there. There are better content creators out there. That's just how it is. You know, I'm I, I've been editing a while, but you know, I'm trying to get better. I'm not like you know a great editor or anything. Um, and there's some really well put together videos out there, uh, with people that really know what they're talking about and um, have you know a better setup than I do and uh, you know have more charisma or you know whatever. And um, that doesn't bother me. I think that's that's fine. It, it's you know, it's all power to everyone out there. That's better than me. That's fine. Um, I think to me it's just astounding because maybe I just I don't get it. I guess in my head it's like, why are people watching my videos when there are hundreds of other YouTubers out there that are doing what I'm doing, but uh, you know, a hundred times better? Um, it's just like, why would you watch me? Like what? Um, but, you know, I I don't know. I guess... I mean, I, I really don't know why. I really don't. I mean, I, I put a lot of effort forward, of course. But, you know, uh, I don't know. I just, I really, I, I appreciate, I really just so much appreciate everybody who's who's there. It, it's seriously, I mean, I, I, I feel like I can't say it enough. It, it, it's, it feels like, you know, my dream is coming true. And that's incredible um I, I didn't know when i made that first mortal kombat video that it would reach as many people as it did and um it's really just you know it's kind of scary you know knowing that there's you know, a lot of people who 
have seen my videos, but, you know, it's not, you know, horrifying. It's just, uh, it's just weird, I guess. I, God, yeah, I don't know. I, um, really, I mean, th thank you to everybody. I, <laughs> now I feel like I'm, I'm blabbing it again because I, I guess ran out of things to say once and once more, once again. God damn, I, this is really going on fucking forever. Um, I just really, you know, I hope, I, I you know, I, I'm really, like, I feel like I'm, I'm talking to nothing right now because I don't feel like anyone's going to watch this. There might be someone that's watching the video and, like, falls asleep to it or something and wakes up around this, this point. Um, and if that's you, then, uh, good morning, sweet pea. I hope you had a good sleep. You know, I hope, you, I hope you're sleeping well. Um, you're probably going to turn me off now, but, you know, I hope that you, uh, you know, you have a good rest, I guess. I don't know. Fuck. Um, I just, damn. Yeah, I don't even know if anyone's watching to this point. I mean, it's, this video is, like, fucking feature length. It's, uh, I seriously, I've worked so fucking hard on this video. I start college again, like, you know, I start classes again next week. I had classes in June, which was hell. July, I was just, I was busy. I, I was out of town, and I was just busy as fuck all month. And then in August, I've kind of had time, but not really. And I'm about to start college again, you know, classes next week. So it's kind of fucking horrible. It's kind of, uh, it's scary because, like, I don't want to, like, starve anybody of, of content. But I also, you know, I want to keep making content because I love doing it. Like, I'm very passionate about it. I fucking love doing it. And so, you know, if I stop doing it or something... You know, that would that would suck ass. So I'm I'm really hoping that I I can manage my time okay. I'm gonna take a little swig of water. This is really just taking fucking forever, isn't it? Um Fuck me. I <laughs> God damn. I uh I mean, some of, some of this bonus shit is just kind of so unneeded. Like, I don't need the Mortal Kombat gold fucking logo. That's not cool bonus shit. It's just a logo. I, I you know, it, it, that means nothing to me. You know, concept art and, uh, you know, back, back, you know, behind the scenes videos and shit. That's cool. You know, what's not cool is, um, stupid ass, you know, and the developers. That's fine. That's fine. But... You know, fucking logos. I don't, I don't give a shit. I don't give a fuck about logos. Um. Yeah, it's kind of just you know nothing for me. I don't, I don't. I don't care. Man, this is this is seriously fucking ridiculous at this point. I might just like fucking stop. To be honest, this is just kind of this is mind numbing. I've been sitting here for uh, what twenty five minutes or so. So this is pretty. This is pretty fucked. Uh, yeah, fuck it. All right, well, that's enough. I have a whole bunch of more coins, but I'm not going to worry about it. All right, so let's look at content. All right, so characters. What characters did I unlock in the, the crypt? Quan Chi, which I guess it shows the character bios, which you've already seen if you watch the video. Congratulations, you have unlocked Quan Chi's alternate costume. To select the alternate costume, highlight the character and press the start button. And it's literally just that for all the characters. But you've already seen literally all of these in the video, so I'm not going to show each individual one. There's no fucking reason for me to do that. Um, endings, which you've also already seen, so it doesn't matter. Uh, arenas. View arena images and stories purchased in the crypt. Images and stories? What do you mean? Nether ship. Oh! Okay, wait. Let me look at this. Info? Ages ago, Shang Tsung used to transport across the Lusty to the Celestial Portal of Outworld. It was also used to bring warriors from the mainland to Shang Tsung's island fortress. In ancient times, vessels like these were referred to as ghost ships. I don't remember. I don't think I ever played on that map. So, yeah, I, I guess I did unlock that map. But I, these other maps I didn't unlock. Those are just there. So I guess it has that too, you know. Uh, concept art. Cool. So this is, I guess, cool shit. This is shit that I care about the most. Okay, how much... Okay, I'm locked a pretty good amount. I'm not going to click on each individual one, but just, you know, here it is. Deadly Alliance is born. Some sketches. Moloch promo render? That might be interesting. Yeah, that's cool. A high-resolution render of Moloch in action. 
Ah, that doesn't look too high resolution, but you know, okay. Scorpion concept sketch. I guess it's interesting if you wanna you wanna read anything, but okay, let's see. Senate of the Elder Gods test. Let's look at this. <laughs> look at that. They're T-posing and shit. Which is, I like seeing shit like this because it's like, damn, you know, this is them creating like the very earliest basic building blocks of the game, and that that's cool to me. I really like seeing uh, shit in development. Movado sketches, Shing Sing's palace sketch. Like I, I like I like concept art, but I really like the videos and like the the early renders and shit. Like that's that's really cool. Um, let's see, Scorpion goes back to hell video. It looks like Mortal Kombat Four. Okay, so I guess that's that's funny. So okay, that's a Mortal Kombat Four cutscene, but that's the Nintendo sixty four version, I believe. That's not the PS. That's not the pre rendered weird one. That's funny. Okay, Cave Arena concept. Okay. Wait, is this an arena that I played in? I don't remember even playing in this arena, to be honest. This might be one that I haven't unlocked. See, this shit's cool. Like I, like I said, I like concept art. But I really like the videos and shit of, like, early renders and, um... Like, early Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance Pro... Like, I love this shit. It's, like, pre-pre-alpha shit. Like, it's, it's cool. It's just cool to see, like, how they rendered shit. And I, I like to see, um like game franchises like Mortal Kombat and how they evolved over time like how it went from the original Mortal Kombat and how it looks better in Mortal Kombat 2 and even better in 3 and 4 is you know, kind of a step back I think um, but you know it's just because it's 3D or whatever I, I, I still like seeing it even if it's early 3D it still is kind of interesting how it evolved from that and in only 5 years time it evolved into this which is crazy it looks you know this game looks infinitely better than Mortal Kombat 4 and um Okay, well, this is kind of long. You know, I don't need to see this for... Can I skip this? Yeah, okay, that, that's enough. I think I got the I think I got the gist. It's, it also has no audio, so... Ice Palace test. See, like, shit like this, it's, like, so interesting. It's, like, they didn't... You know, this was, like, before they put, like, any textures or, like, real geometry. It's just, like, the most basic building blocks of a concept of what they were going to do. And that's that's cool. And Dragonfly concept render? Like, even shit like this. It's just like, I don't know. Something about it. It tickles my brain a certain way. Um, and I like that. Shao Kahn Warriors. This is Goro. This is... Okay, so yeah, see, that's interesting. This is Goro in Mortal Kombat 4. So it's like... I, I also really like, like, Cyrax test render. Like, that's... It's it, it's cool how they're, they also have shit from, like, the older games... Like, this is from Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, but, you know, like, you know, the the Goro thing that I just showed, and then also the Scorpion Goes Back to Hell, like, Lin Kuei Temple concept. It's just, it's interesting. I, li I like seeing shit like that. Okay, well, that's probably the bulk of the, the extra content. Uh, extras, view team photos and other items. Okay, let's see. So I think these are just, like, the, yeah, these are, like, the random, random shit. Um, I wonder if I can just, like, scroll through them from here. I can't. I have to click on each individual one. So, like, that's cool. It's just, like, the security cabinet. Quan Chi's tattoos, which is just Quan Chi's tattoos. Shang Tsung's palace. That's cool. Quan Chi's throne. Like, that's that's cool. It's it's, it's kind of concept art-ish, but it's also just, like, you know, images of random shit. But then also shit like Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 Arcade Marquee. Like, okay. Portal Sphere. And then what, what is this, though? The grid guest stars? Like, there's there's the Mortal Kombat 4, Scorpion, and Sub-Zero in the background. But I don't know who the fuck any of those other hoo-hahs are. But whatever. The grid Mortal Kombat ninjas? What the hell? What is this? What is this from? I don't even know, but it's, it's weird. Blood energy drink. What the fuck? Blood orange energy drink. Soar all night long. And it's Natara. Like, that's backstage Mortal Kombat 4 commercial. Look at that. I, that's cool. They're just they're doing their thing. It's just pictures. Mortal Kombat 4 commercial. Yeah. Another Mortal Kombat 4 commercial, I meant. Like, look at that shit. It's so weird. Mortal Kombat Gold logo. Don't need to look at that. Book of Destiny. Whatever the hell that is. Great Dragon Age. I know the info has more context, but... What the hell? Kano's Sugar... T Kano's. <laughs> that's so fucking funny. Let's see. Info. Before heading into combat, Kano likes to start his day with the wholesome goodness of Kano's cereal. Its vitamins and minerals give Kano the energy to give his toughest opponents a massive butt-kicking. Kano's, the only cereal that makes blood-colored milk. 
Like, it's it's so stupid. And I really... I love to see developers that had fun making their game. Like, there's passion behind this game. And shit like this proves it. Like, they did not... They didn't need to do this at all. Like, this it's stupid bullshit, but I like it. Like, it's it's just interesting. And then, you know, developer, of course, Carlos Bacina. Dragonfly story. But it, it's just... Lifeguard Sonia, Quan Chi on the sax. Like, why? Why is there Quan Chi on the sax? A new prodigy joins the jazz masters, Quan Chi, with soulful music influenced by Life on Netherrealm's Mean Streets. Quan Chi delivers his first major label album, Kind of Black and Blue. Buy it or else. <laughs> like, it's so stupid. Why? <coughs> action figures. More action figures. More action figures. Mortal Kombat 3 Arcade Market, you don't look at that. And then Quality Assurance Chicago. Oh, yeah, it's way better image, actually, than the one I showed in the preview. Look at these guys. These guys are Quality Insurance... Uh, quality Assurance in Chicago for this game. That's crazy. Ed Boon. Yeah, look at that man. Mortal Kombat 2 print ad. And uh, I like shit like this, like the, the ads. Like, that's interesting. Mortal Kombat has finally met its match. It hurts so good they had to come back for seconds. Like... It's cheesy, but I, I fucking love it. More action figures. I need to look at all of them. Action figure vehicles? Huh. That's interesting. I didn't even know they had that. A long time ago? What the hell? It's just... Softer side to Cyrax? Feelings. A collection of poems and essays. Look at the way he's reading it. The poetry and essays of feelings are the perfect meditation between fatalities. Buy it now at your local realm bookstore. Lots of people think that I'm just a violent mechanical assassin. True, but that's only one part of me. When I'm not shredding someone in my machinery, feelings lets me get in touch with my human side. Cyrax LK44. Like, <laughs> it's, like, why? This is just a screenshot of Mortal Kombat 1, which, whatever. Mortal Kombat 3 arcade cabinet. That's actually cool. Yeah. Mortal Kombat 2 roster. <laughs> Mortal Kombat Youth Clothing. What the hell? <laughs> Mortal Kombat T-shirts, comic book art. One of one, one of 41, two of 41, five. You know, I'm not going to look at all the comic book art. I don't need to look at all that, but... Okay, it's... So, yeah, comic book art. Herman Sanchez. Mortal Kombat Pinball. Gold print ad. Okay, that's cool. Kenshi's sword. Come at four logo. Sub Zero's coffee mug. Look at him. He enjoying the hell out of that shit. Sub Zero's freezing fists of fury were always turning his hot cup of morning coffee into a mocha popsicle. That is until he tried the official Mortal Kombat coffee mug. Made of titanium and high grade steel, this combat mug will withstand your menacing grip and keep your coffee warm for hours. 32 pack of adult diapers? What? What? Duties. For recreational use only. I... Uh, tired of those inconvenient accidents. Hate missing a killer fatality because of a trip to the bathroom. Your worries are now over with duties, adult diapers. Like, why? This, it's so stupid. I, it's, there's no need, but it's so fucking funny. I, I, uh, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance merch. Kano's Reminder. What? Holding... What? Before being thrown away from a skyscraper by Sonya Blade, Kano had grasped a lock of her hair and ripped it from her head. He's kept it ever since then as a reminder of their rivalry. And I like shit like that. It's like just some random lore. Mortal Kombat 4 home version. What's the what's the info it says on for this? Box artwork from a home version of Mortal Kombat 4 released back in 1998. But like, I, I like how there is info on all of them. Like, there's context. Like, it's, it's interesting. And, and some of it's just goofy. Some of it's like, you know, they didn't need to do that. But it, it's interesting. I, I like that. And then making of Mortal Kombat view video, which I'm not gonna do. Uh, history of Mortal Kombat, that's interesting. Music video, it's probably all copyrighted, so I'm not gonna show that. But anyway, oh, it's late. I um, really, if you watched all the way here, that's fucking crazy. Um, and I appreciate that. I, I like that's fucking crazy. Anyway, um, I really hope you enjoyed. Um, watching this video, I, I, like I've said many times, I worked so fucking hard on it. So, um, yeah, anyways, uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.
Just two years after the release of Deadly Alliance, Midway released Mortal Kombat Deception. Mortal Kombat Deception is widely regarded as the best 3D Mortal Kombat game. It borrowed a lot of assets and movesets from Deadly Alliance, but it also added some features. Notably, it added the Conquest mode, a full-blown story where you play as Shujinko, who's on a quest from the Elder Gods to collect all of the realm's Kami Dogu. It has an open world where you're free to explore areas of the Mortal Kombat universe. Really, it was super ambitious for its time, especially for a studio that primarily works on fighting games. It released on October 4th, 2004 to good reviews. This is technically the first Mortal Kombat game to release in my lifetime. Later in 2006, it got a release on the PSP under the name Mortal Kombat Unchained, which is a surprisingly faithful port, and later on, Mortal Kombat 11 would release on the Switch and Mortal Kombat 1 as well, which are also surprisingly faithful ports. In addition to a fleshed out conquest mode, this game also has chess combat and puzzle combat, two alternate game modes for the player to enjoy. The stage has got new fatalities as well as hazards that would essentially break one stage into multiple stages. It also added online multiplayer for those with broadband adapters. At the time, Deception would be the most ambitious and content-rich Mortal Kombat at that point. But is the game still as good as people want to believe it is? That's what I'm going to find out in this video. So sit back, lay back, relax, get some popcorn or chips or your meal that you're currently eating and you clicked on this video to watch while you're eating, whatever you may be doing, enjoy the video. I'll be structuring this video as follows. I'll first talk about a certain section in the conquest mode, which I broke up into different stages of the game after receiving a Kamidogu. After I'm done with that section, whatever characters I met that gave me training, I will go to arcade mode and play through and talk about. I'll also take a couple pauses to talk about chess combat and puzzle combat. Then, after I'm done with the conquest and playing through all the characters, I'll talk about some aspects of the game such as the stages and actual gameplay feel. If there's any parts you'd rather skip or would like to hear a specific part, I've put chapters in the video so you can scroll around at your leisure. Let's start off with the story video that shows when you first boot up the game. It was not by chance that this struggle came to be. The blame falls squarely upon my shoulders for giving evil the chance it needed, and therefore fulfilling an ancient prophecy. Raiden's Earthrealm champions had failed to stop the Deadly Alliance from fully resurrecting the mummified army of the Dragon King. In the end, only Raiden himself stood between Earthrealm and total destruction. Defying the Elder God's wishes, he alone challenged Quan Chi and Shang Tsung in mortal combat, Earthrealm's last hope for freedom. fought well against the two sorcerers, and it seemed as though victory was at hand. But the combined might of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung proved to be overwhelming, even for a Thunder God. Raiden was defeated. The Deadly Alliance had won. Their victory was short-lived. As suspicion and lust for power overcame both Quan Chi and Shang Tsung, the former allies turned on each other. The deadly alliance was no more. <laughs> defeated Shang Tsung and reveled in his conquest. But it is said that there is only one true ruler of Outworld.
and that ruler had returned. Fulfilled. The Dragon King had indeed returned to Outworld to reclaim his army and impose his dominance. Death awaited all who stood in his way. was formed out of desperation. Sworn enemies joined forces to combat a greater threat. Raiden began to realize that even their combined might was not enough to defeat the Dragon King. There's only one chance left. Raiden's sacrifice was in vain. For the blast had little effect on the Dragon King. Now Onaga has what he needs to shape the realms as he sees fit. I was the fool who brought him this power. Only I can destroy this threat, born of deception. Earth Realm. As an introduction to the mode, I feel like it does a pretty good job. Immediately, it's very clear that they actually put their blood, sweat, tears, and cum into this mode. You can actually move around, looking like you just smoked up the fresh Heisenberg pack. The voice acting is kinda goofy, sounds a little like they just got children that had never done voice acting before, but it's okay. The first thing you do is meet with Master Bo Raicho, who's teaching combat to the children in this little village. After a segment similar to Conquest and Deadly Alliance, you then have to follow this little shit to the next school, rinse and repeat a couple of times, and then you get a fetch quest. Hey, it's nothing that's going to change my life, but it's better than the nothing that was in Deadly Alliance. I then discovered violence. You can just beat the hell out of everyone you see, which is so awesome. I mean, look at the way these motherfuckers fly when I punch them. I also broke into many people's houses and took their shekels. You can talk to a whole bunch of the townsfolk, and they'll just give you little quests to do. Most of them just normal fetch quests. It's not much, but it does do a bit of world building and makes the village feel like it's lived in. After completing the last training with Bo Rai Cho, someone who claims to be an Elder God grants me the power of absorbing other people's moves to use in combat. You beat Bo Rai Cho, then leave the village. You're sent into quite a large expanse of land that has a lot of just empty filler areas, but also some little villages and the monk temple and such. You go to Bo Rai Cho at his house and he trains you by teaching you his moves. It's basically the same thing as playing as Bo Rai Cho in Conquest back in Deadly Alliance, but the good part is that it doesn't have a long drawn out sequence telling you shit you don't care about and then having you mindlessly press buttons forever. It's a lot more streamlined and easily completable. After finishing Bo Rai Cho, I had to get the medallion that he lost, but instead of returning it to him, the man claiming to be an elder god convinced me to not give it back and instead show it to the Lin Kuei to gain the respect and go to the Kamidogu. You do Sub-Zero's Conquest Mode little thingy, and you get the Kamidogu and leave Earthrealm. Bo Rai Cho. In an effort to save Li Mei, he broke into Shang Tsung's palace. Raiden met him on the other side and told him about Anaga being back. As far as I could tell, when I was playing as him in arcade mode, he hasn't really changed at all since Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. I don't really care because that makes it easier for me to play through this game, and it also makes it feel like all the grinding beforehand will help me here, but that also means that I won't have much extra to say about each character like I did in the last game. I really do like Bo Rai Cho a lot though. He's a goofball. Onaga seemed invincible. The races of Outworld were in disagreement over how to deal with this threat, and Baraka's hordes were sweeping the land. Bo Rai Cho had almost given up hope when he was visited by the spirit of his greatest student, Liu Kang. Their roles now reversed. Liu Kang gave Bo Rai Cho the inspiration necessary to continue the fight. Bo Rai Cho's soul was invigorated. He met with Outworld's many leaders to forge a temporary truce. Kitana gave him command of what remained of her army, and he led them to battle against Baraka's mutant foot soldiers. The new army of Outworld crushed the Tarkata vermin, and Baraka himself was bested by Bo Rai Cho's attack. The victory inspired the people of Outworld to rise up against the Dragon King. 
Sub-Zero. Frost betrayed Sub-Zero and killed herself in the process. Sub-Zero happened upon some ancient ruins. He found out they belonged to the people who mastered cold. He laid Frost to rest and put on the armor of his newly discovered ancestors. Design kinda lame in my opinion. He doesn't look like Sub-Zero at all in this game. His moves are pretty standard, but holy hot fucking shit. The noob smoke fight was absolutely insane. I died on it because they just kept fucking gangbanging me the entire time like holy shit, I just cannot fucking move and they keep pounding me. On his way to the rendezvous point with Raiden and the others, Sub-Zero was ambushed by a band of Tarkatan warriors in the living forest. He tried to outrun them, but there were too many. He was quickly surrounded. Sub-Zero decided that his last living deed would be to vanquish as many of these barbarians as he could before he succumbed to death. As Sub-Zero began his attack, he felt his armor speak to him. It guided and strengthened each blow as he broke their limbs and crushed their skulls. At his feet, a dying Tarkatan warrior uttered the words, Long live the Dragon King. Netherrealm. Immediately entering Netherrealm, I notice the atmosphere is really good from the beginning. It feels foreboding. This place is empty. There's just people walking around that are essentially just corpses. The ambient music paints a canvas of pain and suffering. You talk to Ashra, learn her moves, and then go outside of the little city area. At this point, the ambiance kind of wore off, and I was just kind of bored. The entire nether realm is just flat land with some lava between and weird zombies walking around. It feels dull and lifeless, which, yeah, of course, I mean, it should. It's supposed to be hell, but they could have filled it out a little more with some weird plants or maybe some little hills or just something. Anyways, Ashra is trying to purify her soul and leave the nether realm, so she tries to kill Ermac. You find Ermac, you learn Ermac's skills, and he's here to kill Ashra, so they fight. Something I do like at this point is that it does have the player do actual fights outside of the normal ending fight of Conquest. At this point, you get the Kamidogu for the Nether Realm, and you go to the Nexus in which someone named Monster tries to stop you, and I have a sneaking suspicion that it's Scorpion, considering he shares the same exact moveset as Scorpion. Ashra. Ashra lived as a demon in the Nether Realm for many, many years. Quan Chi betrays her and sends her sisters to kill her. She discovered a heavenly sword. The sword allowed her to kill demons and make her more pure, allowing her to eventually leave the Nether Realm. Ashra is a fine addition to the game. Her moves aren't insanely unique, also having projectiles that work similarly to the majority of characters in this game. I did like her weapon a lot though, the Kreese or Chris or however you pronounce it. Her design I think is pretty good, she does stand out a bit from a lot of other human characters. I know it's still early in the game and I have a lot more gameplay to experience and a lot of time to get better, but goddamn, that noob smoke fight just seems really fucking challenging, I don't know how I'm gonna pass that later on. Noob Saibot was not originally a demon, which might explain why Ashra sensed such great evil in him. He had to earn his place in the Nether Realm. He actually desired to remain there. His companion, however, seemed to be having a problem adjusting. Perhaps there was some good left in the cyborg. Whatever the case, Noob would have to face Ashra alone. Ashra defeated Noob Saibot and finally earned her ascension from the Nether Realm. But the sword that made her escape possible did not travel with her. I suspect it still remains in the Nether Realm, waiting to release another of its denizens from damnation. Ermac. Ermac, I guess, isn't just one person, it's a collection of souls, but I'm gonna talk about Ermac like it is one person. Kenshi freed him from Shao Kahn's power, Liu Kang convinced him to defeat Onaga. Ermac feels right at home in this game. Thankfully, he actually gets some justice in this game, and he gets to be a fully fleshed out, fully playable character with unique moves. Telekinesis moves similar to Kenshi in Deadly Alliance, but still. His design is great in my opinion, but maybe I'm biased because I love the color red. His design is simple but memorable. His green eyes are just so beautiful. His axe is very fun to use. Noob Smoke gangbanged me again. In an outer chamber of the Dragon King's throne room, Ermac did battle with Liu Kang's enslaved comrades. Ermac was more than a match for the five warriors, but their defeat was not his objective. Liu Kang materialized and one by one freed their souls while Ermac occupied the rest. Eventually, all five were awakened from their enchantment and freed from Onaga's control. Ermac was pleased that his warrior's skills could for once bring about a noble outcome. He sensed, however, that an ominous force still shaped the destiny of the realms. It was everywhere. He could feel its influence on Onaga, though the Dragon King was oblivious to its manipulation. Time was running out. Ermac feared the celebration of this latest victory would be short-lived. 
Chaos Realm. Entering the Chaos Realm and looking at the map, it looks really interesting. A lot more appealing than the fucking empty Nether Realm. Talking to a couple of people, I noticed that there's lore that you can gain from simply just talking to people around. I had a fight with Hotaru to get in, then I go to a cemetery and defeat Smoke. I then meet up with Havoc, who needs me to defeat some people for him. I beat all of the Satan guards, and they all happen to be Hotaru. Something kinda cool is that it has me play as each of the four characters I've learned so far. Oraicho, Sub-Zero, Ashra, and Ermac. The thing is though, this part was insanely easy, I mean you would have to be a fucking lobotomite to lose a single round. Havoc lied about showing you the Order of Chaos, but now you get to learn his shit. Actually, turns out he was teaching you, he was just trolling when he said he was gonna kill you. He sends you to a weird labyrinth, then the game gives the weirdest cutscene ever, and apparently years have passed from a time-altering liquid, and you got the Kamidogu. As Shujinko walked through the shallow pool, he felt a strange, dizzying sensation, as if the world was passing him by. Chaos Realm was kinda cool, but honestly still pretty barren. Better than the Nether Realm, but I don't know, it still feels kinda empty. It also is pretty annoying to navigate with the portals. The only character I got taught is Havoc, so let's play as him now. I guess this is a good time to mention that I'm going to look up how to unlock every character, so to unlock Havoc, I have to find a chest in Chaos Realm. Havoc. He travels the realms looking to spread chaos and disorder. He undid the order that Hotaru put upon an outworld city. He led the Earthrealmers to Onaga. He wants the fight to never end to maintain chaos. Havoc's actual design is meh, but his special moves are really cool. Havoc's whole gimmick is that he can contort and twist his body. His taunts are him snapping his neck and folding himself. Part of why I love Draman so much is because he's just so fucking nasty. Havoc is similarly fucking nasty. You can hear the sounds of his bones make as they crack, it's like a fucking glow stick. Really, I love this character. His Morningstar mace feels really good and hard hitting. Really, Maverick is just an awesome character and I really like him a lot. Way more fun than I expected. Noob Smoke, of course, gave me a reach around. The others had defeated the Dragon King, but left his broken body unattended on the floor of his throne room. Not long ago, a similar fate had befallen his former advisor, Shao Kahn. Havoc ripped the still warm heart from the carcass and consumed it, thus absorbing Onaga's power to reanimate the dead. Had the Dragon King succeeded in his plans for total domination, the never-ending turmoil of life would have come to a stifling halt. Those who defeated him believed that the realms were at rest once more, but Havoc vowed to restore the chaos that once ravaged Outworld. Shao Kahn would rule again. Before we talk about the next realm, I want to take a second just to talk about Puzzle Combat. It's a pretty simple little minigame, kind of reminds me of Dr. Mario. Each character has a special move which breaks blocks or freezes the enemy blocks or whatever. Basically, two blocks fall at a time, there's four colors on the blocks that there can be, as well as corresponding coins for each block. The coins break the blocks of that color when it touches the block. If the blocks stack to the top of your area, the game ends. When you break blocks, the number of blocks as well as a combo multiplier if you get a chain of coins going off will be sent over to your opponent. That's it. It's a cool little side mode, nothing amazing, but it's cool that it's here at least and it's a pretty good way to get some onyx and platinum coins, so... Anyway, that's all. Back to Conquest. Outworld. Immediately I notice the entire outworld is drenched in purple. That's fine, I'll take some color. I make my way over to the village area where I meet Melina and train as her. She explains that as long as the Emperor surrenders and kills himself, Melina won't kill his people. He doesn't like that idea, so he has you get something valuable t instead to hire guards to help fight. You meet Jade in the Living Forest, an awesome callback to Mortal Kombat 2. You beat Jade, then you get the fucking Kamidogu. No shit, that's the whole realm. Yeah, I'm sure you can go back to the city and do whatever you need to do, but that's side shit. I'm here for the main story. On to Melina. Melina. She's part princess and part Tarkatan. Katana's sister. Katana sent her to prison before Baraka freed Melina. Baraka tells her that Onaga has her sister's body, so Melina chooses to fight for Onaga. Man, how the fuck do those things not fall out? She must put a lot of fucking trust into that outfit. Melina has always been a cool character to me, as she is part of the same race as Baraka, who is my favorite character in the series. Her sigh is pretty cool to use. None of her moves are spectacular or anything, but I did enjoy playing as her. This time I died to Dairu. I kinda suck as Melina, to be honest. The 
Because it was widely believed that Princess Katana had slain her many years ago, none were suspicious of the veil Malena wore to conceal her Tarkatan features. It was not difficult for her to assume the identity of the princess and take control of her alliance. To further conceal her deception, Melina gave command of the armies to Boraicho and instructed him to lead the attack against Baraka's diversionary forces. Baraka's militia had failed to divert the enemy and to her surprise was decimated by Boraicho's forces. She then realized that she was in control of the most powerful military force in Outworld and Edenia combined. She had finally achieved her true purpose, her destiny. But Melina could not continue her charade indefinitely, not as long as Baraka knew the truth. She ambushed him in the ancient beetle lair and fed him to a swarm of flesh-eating insects. All hail, Princess Katana. Order Realm. Damashi tells Shujinko to have the Satan take over the Overlord's city without the Overlord's permission, and Shujinko obliges. I met up with Hotaru in Oda Realm to train. He sends me down to the road to defeat Darius. After defeating him, you return to Hotaru and meet him in Outworld to defend the city. Hotaru took over the city because the Overlord did not remember the arrangement. You're met outside by Tarkatans and talk to Baraka who tells you that he's going to be punished. You fight him. After defeating him, you train with him. You go back to the Nexus and you're told that you can fight in the Mortal Kombat tournament in Earthrealm. You meet Kenshi in Earthrealm. He tells you to look in the southwest, then you meet Nightwolf that tells you you're evil. You train with him to get rid of the evil. You spend many years with him in a cutscene. Eleven years to be exact. It's 2027 now, like goddamn. You meet Shang Tsung and fight him. You let Kenshi know you found Shang Tsung. Then Kenshi trains you. Damashi is pissed that Nightwolf cleansed you, so he tells you to go to the Nether Realm to make his soul more evil. You meet Raiden when you're trying to leave. Raiden questions that you're a champion of the Elder Gods, saying that you would have to have the power of ten warriors as well as be able to fight with your eyes closed. Well, it's Raiden's lucky fucking day because that's exactly what I can do. Man, Raiden fucking kicked my ass though. It took me many tries, but I did eventually get him. Then it's time to head to the Nether Realm. Goddamn, I know this section is getting pretty long, but when I decided I would structure the video this way, I was under the impression that you could only go through each realm once for the Kamidogu and that was all. I'm still going to continue under their Order Realm name until I get to the last realm. You barter with Scorpion and convince him to train you in return for helping him find Quan Chi. You find Quan Chi for Scorpion, then you fight him as Scorpion. Also, I just now noticed how much worse the characters look outside of the main game, in the conquest mode. Goddamn, I hated this fucking stupid ass goddamn fucking bullshit fight. I did do it though, then Quan Chi ran away like a little bitch. It cuts to Draman and Moloch chilling, but Moloch is strangely the same size as Draman. You leave the Nether Realm and meet Raiden in the Nexus. Now you go to fucking Outworld to help out Raiden because the Deadly Alliance has been formed. Fuck's sake, man. I just kind of want to continue with the other realms and getting the Kamidogu. All this back and forth and training kind of sucks because I just want to go straight to the arcade after each character, but my brain only lets me do that once I've completed the Kamidogu section. Anyways, I go to Outworld meeting Kano. He tries to force you to build a house. You meet Li Mei and she wants you to train her, but she really trains you. Then Shujinko suggests you get Hotaru to help, and you arrive and apparently wait against an ordinance that you didn't know about, so now you're going to trial in Order Realm. For many years, you sit awaiting trial. Now it's fucking 2047. Bro was held in jail for 20 years over a simple mistake. Shujinko is old as fuck now, like goddamn. Dairu comes out of nowhere and kills the guards. You meet with Hotaru and he's saying that you would have been proven innocent, but now that you have to fight Hotaru uh, to not be in trouble. Hotaru hasn't aged a goddamn day, which is pretty silly considering Shujinko aged like crazy. I think I killed him, and now, finally, I get the fucking Kamidogu for Order Realm. Now, Shujinko is becoming suspicious of Damashi, since he doesn't think that his quest really does anything for the Elder Gods. I go to the Nexus and place the Kamidogu. Goddamn, what a long segment. Hotaru. He supports Onaga because he believes that Onaga brings order to Outworld. He goes to try to hunt down Sub-Zero for going against Onaga and killing Tarkatans. I did okay, but of course Noob Smoke just fucked me so deep that I can't even fucking walk anymore, I mean come on man, fuck. Anyways, Hotaru has a fine design, nothing that's going to blow your dick off, but he's cool enough I guess. His flame that pops up the enemies is pretty fun, and he has some fun combos, all I really have to say. In the wilds of Outworld, Hotaru captured the renegade Earthrealm warrior Sub-Zero and brought him before the Dragon King. Onaga's judgment of Sub-Zero was swift, and Hotaru was given the task of carrying out his punishment. Death. His fate served as a reminder to all who would challenge the authority of the Dragon King. Baraka. He's a member of the Tarkata race, and he's basically always been subservient to the villains. He ravages Outworld with his army to distract the Earthrealmers. Oh boy, oh boy, my goddamn homeboy Baraka. 
I'm absolutely in love with Baraka. What that fucking mouth do? He's just as fun in this game as he was back in Mortal Kombat 2. I fucking love this guy so much. His design is fucking awesome. His attacks are fucking awesome. And I literally ended up beating the goddamn game as him yet again, of course. It's just how it is when I play Baraka. No way that I, I actually just... My fucking boy. I, I'm moving my mic. Sorry if the audio is dog shit. Wow. I actually... Wow. My fucking boy, Baraka. I fucking... I, what can I say? I mean, I, that's just perfect. I only use two continues. Champion. Wow. I, I, wow. Okay. I mean, what can I fucking say, man? I, Baraka is just, god damn, I want him so bad. Fuck. Baraka assumed that the treacherous Melina had given her armies a powerful magic. They fought with savage brutality, but he could not stop their advance. He vowed that Melina would pay for her betrayal. Baraka's warriors brought word that she had agreed to meet with him in an ancient lair, but Baraka was no fool. He sent another in his place. Baraka's scouts reported that the Earthrealm warrior Sub-Zero was near. He allowed his remaining militia to deal with him and set off alone to ambush Melina. He knew by the scent of Tarkatan blood on her clothes that she had already killed the one he had sent to meet her. But her sense of smell was not as keen as a true Tarkata's. She was unaware of Baraka's presence. He barked her name, and when she turned to face him, he tore her apart. Damn, I really just, I can't believe I just beat the fucking game as Baraka. I mean, it's poetic, really, really. I mean, I have always just had something for Baraka. Sexually. Nightwolf. He's the shaman of his tribe, he's been corrupted by visions of a dark presence. He can enter the nether realm, but gets stuck there while trying to defeat Onaga. Yeah, I really like Nightwolf a lot. He's just a pretty cool character and a pretty fun one. I use tomahawks pretty much the whole time, and I just have a sweet spot for pop-up attacks. Chaining attacks together with his tomahawks, then using his arrow and his force push thing, it's a lot of fun. And his design is pretty solid as well. I got all the way to Onaga, but he killed me. Nightwolf had traversed realms and fought many demons to get to this place deep within the nether realm. Using knowledge passed to him from his forefathers, he drew a binding symbol on the ground and chanted the ancient words that would draw the spirit of the Dragon King to this wicked place. Nightwolf had carried the burden long enough. He released the sins of his people into the mystic symbol and their weight bound Onaga to the nether realm. Free of the corruption he had harbored for so long, Nightwolf was expelled from the depths of the nether realm and into the unknown. Kenshi. Well, this is kind of fucked up. I hope once I'm done with Conquest I can play it over again, because I need a chest that's at the beginning of the game that I can only get at the beginning of the game to get Kenshi. That's so fucking awesome! So I guess I'll have to wait for Kenshi until later in the video. Scorpion. Trying to ambush Quan Chi. Two Oni catch him off guard and send him to a portal that takes him to the Elder Gods. They gave him the purpose of defending the realms against Onaga. Scorpion is cool, I mean his design is pretty much the same shit from Deadly Alliance from what I remember, so not much to speak on with that. He's pretty decent in this game, fun as usual. I really enjoyed using his sword, his spear is cool, his teleport kick. I mean really, what can I say about Scorpion that hasn't already been said? Who killed me this time in arcade? Noob Smoke. The Elder Gods had transformed Scorpion into their weapon in order to defeat the Dragon King before his plans of domination unmade the realms. With his enhanced abilities, he tirelessly tracked Onaga through the realms until finally he cornered him in the Nexus. The Dragon King had many allies, but they were of no consequence. It was in fact Scorpion who was the true champion of the Elder Gods, the enforcer of their will. Only he could stop the menace that threatened all that exists. Only he could defeat the Dragon King. Li Mei. She was betrayed by Shang Tsung and Quan Chi in the Deadly Alliance, and Bo Rai Cho saved her from being a servant of evil. Bo Rai Cho trains her, and she feels like she must serve Outworld, but she feels drawn to a strange power. Yeah, still don't like Li Mei. Her design just doesn't make sense. When you meet her in Conquest, it's during the time of the previous game. In this game, she looks like a completely different character, and her moves are still underwhelming and shitty. But I actually like her even less than last time. I don't know, she just sucks. I really don't like her at all. I didn't even get to Noob Smoke. An alliance had been formed of warriors from vastly different origins, but with a similar goal. 
to defeat Onaga, Li Mei marched uneasily into battle against the Dragon King. The closer she got to him, the more she came to understand which side was truly deserving of victory. Li Mei turned on her former allies and gave her emperor the time he needed to finish merging the Kami Dogu. The Dragon King was now all-powerful. He had the means to control the universe, to make and unmake as he saw fit. Li Mei watched in delight as the Elder Gods fled before his might. Onaga then transformed her into his queen, to be forever at his side. He had given her power beyond anything she ever imagined. Together, they will rule the One Realm and slay the last of the Elder Gods. Adenia. I enter Adenia, Damashi tells me that someone else might be after the Kami Dogu, so I must be careful. We meet Katana and she asks for help because Shao Kahn has invaded. I need to defeat Tanya to release Sindel. I actually had to use Shujinko's moves, and wow, I got my shit fucked for a while there. I haven't used him since the very beginning of the game, so I couldn't remember his moves for shit. He has no special moves except his grab, which isn't special at all. Anyways, I got past her. You break Sindel out. She trains you. After that, she gives you the Adenian Kami Dogu. Damashi is now able to have a physical body. As you are about to place the Kami Dogu, Scorpion comes to fight you. I had to do it as Shujinko, but I managed to do it first try. He places the final Kami Dogu. He's confused because nothing happens, then Onaga pulls up. Damashi was Onaga the whole time. As Onaga approaches Shujinko, he runs into Earthrealm. Shujinko realizes he totally fucked up. The credits roll. Apparently, if I really want to beat the game, then I have to beat Onaga in arcade mode as Shujinko, but we'll have to see if I do that. I don't really want to spend a crazy amount of time trying to do that. It's worth noting, Shujinko gets more moves if you find them in Conquest, but I'm not going to go for them. As I'm in Conquest trying to unlock characters, if I see any around, I'll pick them up, but I won't go out of my way for it. Anyways, that's the game. I guess for the rest of the characters, I'll just go in order of how they appear on the roster. I randomly just stumbled upon Kenshi's chest. When I was trying to unlock Kira, I ran into a bug where I was stuck fucking meditating. No matter what button I pressed, I was stuck in meditation. Then, when I tried to get Sindel, I stood there and waited until 1am, then I decided to see if meditating wanted to work, and it didn't, and the option to save and quit disappeared, so I had to go fucking back and wait again for the chest. Sindel. Adenia had been invaded by Outworld, and she had been held captive. Her and Jade escaped to learn more about Onaga, who seems to be following in Shao Kahn's footsteps. Sindel's design is very similar to back in Mortal Kombat 3, and that's fine, because I actually think her design is pretty good. She stands out with her hair especially. Her special moves are okay, but really, they are unique enough to stand out. I didn't really like her weapon very much, but other than that, she's a pretty cool character. I died to Noob Smoke again because of a fucking course I did. Although Onaga had returned from the dead, he did not re-inhabit his original body. Sindel and Jade found his sarcophagus opened. His body remained, but the armor was missing. Strangely, the hieroglyphics in his tomb were similar to an ancient Edenian language. She discovered an incantation inscribed by Onaga's holy men that was intended to transport his soul back into its original body. As she was memorizing the spell, Onaga emerged from the shadows. Onaga could have defeated both Jade and Sindel, but instead, he took sadistic pleasure in unleashing Katana against them. He was a fool. Jade held off Katana while Sindel thrust her Quan Dao into the heart of the corpse. As she screamed the ancient incantation, Onaga's soul leapt from Reptile's body into its intended vessel. The corpse came to life and cried in agony as the Quan Dao prevented its heart from reforming. Sindel held the blade firmly in place as Onaga returned to the cold sleep of death. With the Dragon King defeated, the realms were safe, and Sindel's daughter Kitana was free from his spell. May Edenia know peace once more. Jade. She goes to help Katana and her allies, but she was too late. Onaga resurrects them and she follows. Knowing Sindel wouldn't hurt Katana, she defeats Katana and saves Sindel. Jade's design is pretty much just whatever to me. Not horrible, but very, very standard and kind of forgettable. This is the first character I did in arcade mode that I didn't get any kind of training for. I still did fine, but of course Noob Smoke got me. She's not terrible, I prefer her over Lee Mei, but still not the biggest fan ever. The traitor Tanya had given the Dragon King the information he needed to finish merging the Kamidogu. But before he conquered all the realms, Jade would see Tanya dead. Jade had allowed Baraka's soldiers to capture her, feigning defeat in battle. 
As Tanya approached her prisoner, Jade waited for the right moment and threw a glass orb filled with concentrated Tsarkata essence at her. The glass broke, splashing its contents across Tanya's body. Baraka and his vile savages worked themselves into an uncontrolled frenzy. They perceived Tanya to be a rival male and instinctively attacked. I doubt she survived the encounter. Kenshi. He almost dies after fighting Movado, but Sub-Zero saves him. Sub-Zero says that he defeated Hotaru, but Kenshi does not believe him. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kenshi in this game. I love that he's blind. It's just a cool character trait. The way he will face away from the camera or towards the camera, but not towards his opponent. His design is cool, and most importantly, he is really fun to play. His telekinetic moves are cool, and his katana is really fun to use. Can you guess who I died to? Noob Smoke. As Sub-Zero and Kenshi trekked across Outworld, they strove to keep themselves hidden, only traveling at night. But as they neared the portal to Earthrealm, the Dragon King Zealot Hotaru attacked with a blast of glowing energy that temporarily blinded Sub-Zero. Kenshi's sense of sight is of a spiritual nature, thus he was unaffected by the intense flash of Hotaru's projectile attack. In the dark, Kenshi had the advantage. Hotaru did not see his approach. Unaware, he strode in to kill Sub-Zero. It was the last mistake he would ever make. Raiden. Raiden basically removes his god status to try to kill Onaga, Quan Chi, and Shang Tsung all at once. He's pissed that normal mortal men are fucking stupid like Shujinko, so he's no longer a nice guy. He's still a good guy, he's not a villain, but he's not friendly anymore. Raiden's design is pretty much typical. Yep, he's a thunder god, holy shit, I might just fucking shit my pants. But he's evil or some shit, so there's that difference. He plays as he did last time, and he's a fine character. Pretty mid in my opinion, but that's honestly just me. Noob Smoke got me again. My patience for mortals has worn thin. If I am to protect Earthrealm, I must punish those who would threaten it. The fool Shujinko had let himself be deceived into believing that he worked for a greater good. He was in fact an unknowing tool of a greater evil. One that had almost caused the destruction of Earthrealm. That Shujinko undid his mistake and destroyed the Dragon King is of no importance. Those who place Earthrealm in harm's way will pay with their lives. Cabal. He leaves the Black Dragon and Movado from the Red Dragon nearly kills him and steals his hook swords. Havoc saves him. He forms a new Black Dragon and gets skilled warriors to help kill Movado. I still love Cabal's design. I think he's badass. I think his hook swords are cool. The thing is, he plays so similarly to Movado from Deadly Alliance. It's hard to really enjoy a character when they don't feel very unique. Like I said, his design is good, but just not his moves. He's fine, but just like a lot of other characters, he borrows from a different character, making him feel less unique. It sucks, because that was part of my issue with Movado, that he copied Cabal. I don't know. I don't even make it to Noob Smoke. I died to Shujinko. Havoc had given Cabal's new Black Dragon recruits a task. Lure the heroes away from the Dragon King's corpse while he somehow retrieved the heart and with it, Onaga's power to raise the dead. Apparently, Onaga's ancient army had only been invincible by means of constant resurrection during battles. The power to raise the dead would prove quite useful to the Black Dragon clan. Cabal slew Havoc and took the Dragon King's heart for himself. Havoc was most impressed. I was 700 Onyx coins short of getting Noob Smoke, so I went to chess combat to fix that problem, then figured out that... I can't even get it from chess combat, so I went to puzzle combat again, but anyway, here's chess combat. I chose Baraka as my leader, Nightwolf as my champion, Havoc as my sorcerer, Ermac as my shifter, and Scorpion as my grunt. I don't know what any of the shit means, so let's see how it goes. It's honestly pretty cool. It's close to how chess works, but with some added shit like spells. It reminds me of FPS chess. Basically, when you're trying to take a piece, you fight to decide who actually takes that square. It's a cool concept, and I can imagine it being really fun playing with another human. Just a fun little bonus game mode. I kind of wish that they would bring it back, or if they did bring it back for Mortal Kombat 1, that would have been cool, but... You know, only time will tell. Maybe they'll add it in the future or something. Noob Smoke. With all the previous people Noob served being dead, he tries to create his own powerful rule. He finds Smoke decommissioned in a labyrinth of torture cells and brings him back. Noob Smoke is a whole lot of fun. Design ways... Both characters aren't anything too special, but playing as them is great. They don't have weapons, it's just two fighting styles, which is each character. Switching between them to link combos together is just so fucking satisfying and fun. I really like them both a lot. I wish they would double tag team my bunger. I lost a noob smoke. With 
Smoke as his template, new Cybot planned to return to the Netherrealm and use Smoke's nanotechnology to create an army of cyborg demons. He was unaware that they were followed by someone Noob had not seen since before he became a wraith. Smoke instantly recognized their visitor. He was an echo of their past. He was Sub-Zero, Noob Cybot's brother. Noob Cybot was surprised to see how much stronger his brother had become. If he were still Lin Kuei, still human, he would probably have shown some degree of pride. But as Raiden had revealed during the ordeal with Shinnok's amulet, his soul had been tainted when he died at the hand of Scorpion. Noob Saibot, the original Sub-Zero, had descended into the Nether Realm free from compassion. He ordered Smoke to assist him in slaying his brother, his first act as ruler of the Nether Realm. Tanya. She was serving Quan Chi and Shang Tsung during the Deadly Alliance, but they died, so she ended up serving Onaga. I actually like Tanya in this game. She does stand out pretty good, and she has some unique attributes. Her weapon is pretty cool, her fighting styles are fun, I dive to Nude Smoke. Really just an overall pretty solid character. In Edenia, Tanya had located the ancient texts that described the process by which to fuse the Kamidogu into one. With this information, Onaga was able to create the One Kamidogu, a tool of unspeakable power. As the Dragon King was distracted, reveling in his victory, Tanya seized the opportunity to snatch the Kamidogu from him, thereby obtaining godlike power. She destroyed the Dragon King, and became ultimate overlord of the realms. Shujinko. Shujinko is a goddamn fucking idiot. Yeah, 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 he's the main character in the story, and he's all important to the lore and shit, but Shujinko can give fuck himself. First of all, he caused the goddamn predicament of giving Onaga all that power. He's a fucking moron. Gullible ass motherfucker. His moveset? Fucking dog shit. If I want all of his moves, I have to go back into Conquest and find them. Go fuck yourself. So that I would be able to defend myself during the quest to find the Kamidogu, Onaga had given me the power to absorb the fighting ability of any warrior I encountered but his gift would prove to be his undoing. The warriors in Outworld were in disarray. Heroes were not focused on the true threat of Onaga, and villains were unaware that they were bringing about their own destruction by serving him. I united them, and in one moment, absorbed their combined fighting power. I shattered each of the Kamidogu, the source of his invulnerability. This weakened Onaga, and I attacked him without mercy. His mortal form was no match for a combatant infused with the powers of so many warriors. The Dragon King was finally defeated. The realms will remain as they have since the beginning. Dairu. He was part of the Satan Guard for a long time, but he gets kicked out when he kills someone in a fit of rage. He was sent to prison when he escapes. He's no longer embracing chaos or order, he's rather just neutral and a mercenary for hire. He's fine. I don't know. I mean shit. Not too much to say. He borrows fighting styles from other characters from the last game. Kinda just whatever. Normally, Dairu took no risks and ambushed those he had been hired to kill. But in this case, he felt compelled to announce his intentions to kill his fellow guardsman, Hotaru. There still must have been some code of honor left in his cynical heart. Hotaru was defeated, but before Dairu could reveal who had commissioned the attack, Otaru drew his dying breath. Cobra. He trained in school for many years in martial arts. He's from New York. He grew a bloodlust for killing. He was put in the back of a cop car, then Cabal and some girl come try to save him, and that some girl ends up being Kira. Alright, bro thinks he's in Street Fighter. His moves are okay. He's just so mediocre and average from a design standpoint, also from a gameplay standpoint. He just doesn't do anything for me. Cabal brought his new recruits to Outworld where a siege was underway against the Dragon King. Cobra grew impatient. He wanted to join the fray, but Cabal held him back. They were not to attack until the heroes had won. Once the Dragon King had been defeated, Cabal gave the order to strike the victors. The new Black Dragon tore through their ranks and left no survivors. Cobra came to realize that he was going to like being a Black Dragon. Darius. He's the leader of the resistance against the Satan Guard. He can free Satan Guards and recruit them to build an army slowly and remove the Satan from power. 
Darius is actually pretty cool and fun to play. His design is decent, but really his moves are fun as hell. His weapon is also pretty fucking fun and awesome. I actually made it all the way to Onaga, which made me quite happy and pleased, but Onaga did end up kicking my ass anyway. The mercenary Dairu had succeeded in stealing the Declaration of Order and was paid many coins for his efforts. After Darius hid the document, he announced its capture to the world and heralded a new beginning for the realm of Sado. As Darius had predicted, officials were outraged that the Resistance had stolen the most prized possession of the Sadan government. Hotaru was ordered to lead the charge against them. He underestimated their numbers, however, and the Resistance defeated him and his men. The Senate would soon be in the hands of the revolutionaries. Kira. She sold weapons to terrorists in Afghanistan, but when they found out she was a woman, she had to flee. Cabal offered her to join him. He tells her that the new Black Dragon will take over the world and plunge it into anarchy. Kira is pretty decent, uses what I think was Sonya Styles back in Deadly Alliance. I mean, she's not offensive at least, just another average character. Her weapon is pretty fun though, kinda makes me think of Kratos from God of War. Died before noob smoke. Once they had defeated the enemies of Havoc, Cabal complimented Cobra and Kira on their ferocity in battle. Their true test, however, was to face each other, to decide which of them was worthy of the new Black Dragon clan. Neither refused the challenge. Cobra fought with ferocity, but his lack of discipline allowed Kira to control the battle, easily manipulating Cobra into exposing himself to her attacks. She defeated him and proved her worth to Cabal, who gave her the honor of finding two more recruits to pit against each other in mortal combat. Liu Kang. Raiden's blast killed Shang Tsung, which essentially brought Liu Kang back from the dead, since Shang Tsung had Liu Kang's soul. Someone reanimated his body, taking over his corpse and killing many innocent people in the process. I actually had a great time playing as Liu Kang in this game. A lot more fun than I have in Liu Kang in any other Mortal Kombat game, actually. First of all, his design is awesome. I mean, he looks like a fucking zombie. His moves are more or less the same as previously, but they just feel more at home in this game. The only thing I don't like is that his weapon is nunchucks, the same as Johnny Cage had in Deadly Alliance. It would have been cool if maybe it was like brass knuckles or something. Liu Kang's friends had been freed, Onaga had been defeated, and the realms were secure once more. But there was one battle that remained. Liu Kang's body had been used by some unknown force as a tool of destruction. It had left death in its wake and needed to be stopped. The chaos would end in Earthrealm. The fight raged with neither combatant able to best the other when a jolt of energy crackled through them both. Liu Kang's nerve blazed like fire and he felt a rush of air fill his lungs for the first time since his death. He was Liu Kang once more. Protector of Earthrealm, Champion of Mortal Kombat. Anyways, with that, I have now completed all of the meat of this game that I plan on for this video. Now, I'm going to talk about the different aspects of this game. Stages. The stages in this game are honestly all fantastic. The aesthetics of all of them just feel so perfect. The Yin Yang Island stage particularly is really cool. The stage switches from normal and good to evil at random intervals, and making it rain and transform palm trees into giant snakes reminiscent of a hydra. The pit is brought into a full 3D environment and is really cool. Stage fatalities are very easy and basically free. The stage hazards are also very common. Really, in my opinion, this game has the best stages so far in the series. There's a good variety here. Crypt. This time around, the crypt is smaller, which I think is probably a net positive. I got through the majority of the tombstones by simply playing the game. If I did want to get all of them, it's certainly a reachable goal, but back in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, it wasn't so reachable. The biggest issue I have though is that there aren't as many cool parody images like there were for Deadly Alliance. I like to see the developers have fun, and I saw less of that here. That isn't to say the crypt is dull and lifeless, however. I mean, the actual crypt area is much more entertaining and interesting to look at. If you want to see me go more into depth with the crypt and also talk a little bit about random stuff in an unscripted setting, then there'll be a link in the description to my second channel, which will have that video go up at the same time as this one. Gameplay. There really isn't too much to speak on in terms of gameplay. Yeah, it's fun, it's just as good as Deadly Alliance even. Really, nothing to expand on, it's remarkably similar to Deadly Alliance. Roster. I've seen this roster get some shit online, but honestly I think it's pretty good. I like it a lot. It has most of the main characters people want, except for Johnny Cage, Sonya, and Jax. Other than that, it has Cabal, Baraka, and Sindel, which are some of the most interesting Mortal Kombat characters to me. They also have more story and lore added to them through Conquest as well as their bios, I just think it's a pretty good roster. 
Fatalities. This game ha does have some pretty good fatalities, but I don't really want to go into depth about it and show them here because I could just get age restricted. Just know that they're the most brutal and entertaining in the series thus far. I think that's everything I wanted to say about the game. Really, Mortal Kombat Deception is a great game and the best one in the series so far. It's better than Deadly Alliance for sure, given the more cohesive story and tighter crypt as well as some enjoyable side modes. I'm going to give this game an 8.5 out of 10. I really hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, you know, feel free to subscribe, like the video, do whatever you want to do. Not going to force you to do anything, but I just really appreciate everyone's support. Yet again, I'm probably going to stream a little bit more since Mortal Kombat 1 did come out. And I'm hoping to still get the videos that I had planned in a post uh, out soon. Uh, it's just I have a lot of stuff going on, so it's kind of hard, but I am trying. So I appreciate everyone's patience, and have a good day. Thank you. After the reasonably successful previous two entries in the Mortal Kombat series, Midway decided to create a game that was supposed to end off the current timeline and start a new one for the next game. The end is upon us. Mortal Kombat Armageddon was supposed to be a game that totally wrapped up the current story, and also was supposed to give players a complete experience from the past two games with more content to sink into. My issue with this game stems from the fact that the majority of this content is just reused assets from the previous two entries. Whether that be player models, movesets, maps, you name it, there's not a whole lot of original content in this game. And honestly, with so much content that feels the same, I'd say there's way too much content, hence the title of the video. But hey, I'm still gonna play it to completion and give my honest opinions on each character individually, so strap in, because this is gonna be quite the long video. How I'm playing. This video is going to be structured as follows. I'm going to start with Conquest, splitting up each level, talking about some story and gameplay from the different levels, and then giving my opinions about Conquest at the end. After that, I'll talk about the side mode, Motor Combat. I will then, after that, talk about each character individually, including their ending and character bios. Like I said, this is going to be pretty beefy, and if you end up enjoying the video, please consider liking, perhaps subscribing for future videos, especially Mortal Kombat ones. And if you really like it a lot to the point where you're willing to spend money, then you can become a member and gain access to all my videos a day early and also get the full uncensored versions. Without further ado, let's get into the conquest. The conquest starts out with two people basically saying that Taven and Dagon have to start Armageddon from happening, and these are their parents. Taven wakes up and a big dragon named Orin says that it's time to get to Saven the world. Botan Jungle. Starting off on the first stage, I can immediately see an improvement visually compared to Mortal Kombat Deception. This whole area feels alive and lived in. Look at all the green with the trees everywhere and the bugs crawling on the ground that you can step on. It honestly looks great. There's a whole bunch of destructible objects around that have little goodies inside. Opening the chests is so satisfying, the way that Taven just kicks the fuck out of them to open them feels and looks so nice. Once you get past the first little section, collecting coins and relics on the way, you approach Cobra who you fight without even thinking. You get to a cave where you reach an obelisk that takes you to a little tutorial of the fighting outside of 1v1 fights. Before the tutorial, you fight Jarek. It reminds me of Shaolin Monks, but honestly it reminds me more of God of War. It feels pretty fun and makes me look forward to the rest of the game. Taven is just absolutely dumbfounded and totally confused on what the fuck is going on. There's no thought behind those eyes. He talks to his dead dad, who doesn't really tell him much except that he must move on. You get out of the caves and there's some blades that will instantly kill you if you walk into them, and there's more little chests and shit scattered around. You get to an area that gives you a hammer and allows you to just absolutely pound all of the enemies around you, then you fight Cabal. Temple of Argus. You go into a temple that I had some trouble with because I'm an idiot. You fight some guys and then your dad tells you that you need a weapon and you need to defeat Blaze, then Sector comes in and kidnaps you. Takunin Warship. On the ship the special forces come to get Sector out and the fucking ship has a self-destruct sequence and you have to get out quickly. Not too much else to say about it, but I did get meat. At the end I fight Sector and it was really easy because of the special moves that Taven has. Arctica. Gotta go through a little snow area, you fight an ice beast, and then move on where you find Sonya who's questioning you and you have to fight. Then you go and meet some monks who are worshipping an obelisk and you save the abbot who helps you go through and your mom gives you training. I decided to go through all of the trials for the extra coins and also it unlocks the Arctica stage which is pretty cool, no pun intended. The trials were pretty boring though to be honest, I just used the same cycle of attacks I always do and it worked. Afterwards I just go through more of the area and eventually come upon a guy who tells me he's Tengu and tells you about the Link Wei. You go and fight Rain and then after you fight a whole bunch of Link Wei and get to a section where you have to defeat the archers which did make me a little fucking mad but nothing too crazy. Ling Kuei Temple. After defeating that stupid part, Taven goes into the Ling Kuei Temple, which is his mom's temple. I fight some enemies, then go into a room where I have an Ice Scepter, and I have to just spam it in order to actually pass it, because there's a fucking timer the whole time making it so I have to kill enemies rapidly, which got pretty annoying. After that, I break an ice wall and fight Frost. Afterwards, you fight Sub-Zero and open up the vault that has some armor your mom left for you, and you find out your brother woke up before you. You join the Ling Kuei when it gets invaded, and you fight more. Then, there's these big fucking mouths that shoot fire at you and you have to avoid the fireball and hide in the sides and it's not even that hard, it's just kinda tedious and boring. 
I go into another room and fight a shitload of enemies. After that, it's time to fight Smoke. Then right after, I have to uppercut enemies into spikes and then fight Noob. You talk to Orin the Dragon again, who you ask to send you to the Charred Mountain to help Sub-Zero fight his brother. Charred Mountain. Entering the forest, you have to fight enemies. The gimmick this time is that when an enemy spawns with a weapon, you have to use that weapon to kill the enemies in order to progress. Fujin comes to tell you to leave, and you say no, so you fight. You go into the Red Dragon Cave. I make my way through the cave and get the Time Freeze ability, and then I meet Dagon. It turns out he was leading the Red Dragon Clan. He's been trying to kill Taven this whole time. Mavado comes in and says that Blaze was found, then Mavado fights you. You see Kano, who tells you that the Red Dragon are doing experiments to turn people into lizard people. Then you get ambushed by a whole bunch of fucking red lizard people. You get Serena and a couple of other people to fight you, then you fight Reptile. You meet Dagon's dragon, who he enslaved. Dagon also killed both of his parents. You have to follow Dagon through the Nether Realm. Nether Realm Cliffs. You make a jump and fight some undead, then jump down again and Draman gives you a warm welcome. You jump down and fight a whole bunch of undead with some fists, and god damn it, they just kept fucking throwing blood clots or something, and it kept fucking me up and it pissed me off. I ground pounded some switches, then found a monolith that had me do more trials. Pretty standard shit. And then I fight Mataro in the trials. Then I fight Moloch. Then I complete the monolith and get a Sindel alternate costume. You find Shinnok fighting Lime, and you have to fight her. Shinnok leads you to his spire, and Taven doesn't know that Shinnok got banished to the Nether Realm. Shinnok's spire. It starts off with a section where I have to break some blocks to kill off some wraiths, then I go on the second floor and fight a demon who spawns these little tiny imps that I straight up just smash with a hammer. It was pretty fun, honestly. Then I fight Havoc, I make my way up to a room where I hit the enemies on a spike, then another where I kill them with a sword. Time to fight Shiva. Then I fight Kentaro. Both were surprisingly easy. Shinnok is just straight taking advantage of poor Taven. Shinnok is actually helping Dairu. You consult with Orin about Shinnok, but Quan Chi is basically killing Orin. Shao Kahn's Fortress. The first little area is a little annoying, nothing too bad, but goddammit, why do these motherfuckers have so much fucking health? It actually baffles me. I'm just doing the same fucking shit over and over again, like what the hell? Then a big elevator room where I fight more enemies till the elevator finishes. I fight Melina. Shao Kahn's Dungeon. I get put into a room where I have to fight more fucking enemies, yet again. Oh boy. I free some prisoners. I enter the room with the Executioner, and I kill him, and free... Shujinko. Shao Kahn's Fortress in the Shadow of the Colossus. Big statue fight. Easy, then Goro fight. Easy. Shao Kahn's Fortress Throne Room. Big room. I fight more enemies. Then I fight Raiko. I get sent to Obelisk and collect Orb. Shao Kahn and Quan Chi and Shang Tsung and Onaga all talk to each other trying to make an alliance. Then I fight Dark Raiden. Edenian Ruins. I start off fighting enemies and then fight a giant fucking skull for some reason. I fight Scorpion and it was pretty free. Dagon approaches and then Blaze comes and says that you and Dagon need to fight and then fight Blaze. Blaze stands over there at the top of the pyramid and Taven looks at him. Then it sends you to the top of the tower to fight Blaze. I did it third try and straight up... Blaze just fucking explodes. And then it gives me the arcade ending. Kinda stupid. I did honestly really like the conquest in this game. It was a lot more consistently entertaining and enjoyable than the one in Deception for me. The environments look great. They feel lived in and three-dimensional. My biggest problem with the conquest, however, is just how tedious it can get. Most of the time, it's just fighting a shitload of enemies for no reason. Plus, that ending was just kinda weird. I feel like maybe they should have made a more original ending instead of just giving him the arcade ending, but, you know, is what it is. Motor Combat. It's genuinely painful to say this, because I loved Mortal Kombat when I was a kid, but Mortal Kombat just is not very good. It isn't horrible, but it just gets so boring so fast. After playing one race on all maps, it just kind of feels empty. The controls don't feel very good, each character has only one power-up, the stages are cool enough but nothing too amazing or groundbreaking. Some have more laps than others, which is weird because it makes it feel far less consistent that way. It's not a horrible mode, it just really isn't what I remember it being. And I can't really complain too much because it is just another mode in the game, which is nice, but also, I feel like maybe if the developers had spent a little more time fleshing out some characters instead of doing this mode, then it might have paid off more, but, you know, is what it is. So at this point, the rest of the video is pretty much just going to be me talking about every single character. I played as every single character in arcade mode, trying out all their different movesets and their weapon and special moves, just everything. At the beginning of each character, I'm going to show the character bio on screen and then also just kind of read off an abridged version that I wrote. And then once I'm done talking about the character, then I'm going to play the ending cutscene. Of course, there's chapters throughout this, so if you want to see a specific character or you don't want to see the bios or whatever, then the chapters are there. Not every single character in this game has a character bio. I'm not 100% sure of the reasoning behind that. I think part of it is because a lot of the characters were in Deception and their bio didn't change whenever Armageddon came out. So for the characters that don't have a bio, I'm just going to talk about how I felt about the character and then show the ending. And then for the characters that do have a bio, I will show the bio, then talk about the character, then show the ending. I mean, what's there to say about Scorpion that hasn't been said in the last two videos? Characters have two fighting styles in this game, so there are even less moves to talk about. He's definitely very fun, his grab move is satisfying. Cool character with a good design, that is all. 
As the fire of Blaze was extinguished, what appeared in its place brought elation to Scorpion's tormented soul. His ninja clan, the Shirai Ryu, had been fully resurrected. Numbering in the thousands, they covered the surface of the pyramid awaiting Scorpion's command. Among them was Scorpion's wife and son. Their reunion was to be short-lived. The sorcerer Quan Chi suddenly appeared among them. He grabbed Scorpion's young son and disappeared through a portal to the Netherrealm. Enraged, Scorpion ordered his clan to hunt down the sorcerer. He will not rest until his son has been recovered and Quan Chi is dead. Sub-Zero. His design is standard, I think it's fine. He plays as he normally does, albeit a little drawn back. He doesn't have the slide, and I know that's because Frost has it, but come on, that's Sub-Zero's fucking move, let's be real here. I mean, he's enjoyable, but that's all I have to say about him. The Dragon Medallion, having amplified the godlike power granted him by his victory over Blaze, Sub-Zero was no longer a mere warrior, but an ice god. He was, however, a false god. He had become a deity without the consent of the Elder Gods, who sent their champions to hunt him down and destroy him. Reptile. His design in this game is honestly my favorite in the whole series. It plays into him not being human while also making him look badass and not stupid. It's like his Mortal Kombat 4 design if they actually try to make it look good. His moves are here and they're pretty enjoyable, but what's most enjoyable about him in my opinion is his weapon. He attacks really fast with it and it's just very satisfying to use. As the shockwave caused by Blaze's death rattled the surrounding crater, the pyramid on which Reptile stood began to crumble. A fissure opened to reveal a sarcophagus of familiar design. Reptile unlocked the curious artifact to find a female Zeteran. As she awoke, Reptile felt himself slowly reverting back to his humanoid form. The glory of Zatera will return once more. Rain. Rain is a traitor of Edenia. Shao Kahn was gonna kill him, but he decided to join Shao Kahn in order to protect himself. Rain honestly looks pretty fucking badass in this game if I'm honest. He just looks like you don't want to fuck with him. His moves are pretty fun as well. I like his water pump move thing and his lightning bolt. I managed to make it all the way to Blaze and I lost, but hey, I did make it pretty damn far. Fun character. The half-brother of Taven and Dagon, Rain absorbed the power of Blaze and became a full god. I had not anticipated that the victor would be the son whose true identity I have hidden for so long. I bestowed the title of Protector of Edenia on Rain, but my pride in my son was misplaced. He uses his power to enslave Edenia, and now that I have ascended to Elder God status, I am forbidden to stop him. Ermac. He's composed of many souls, he was serving Shao Kahn, but now he's free to be his own guy. Ermac has a cool design in this game and he's pretty fun to play. His only useful move in my opinion is his telekinetic throw, not much else more than that. I mean his moves are cool, just not super useful. I did fine, but I got to Draman and my god, he is the one who blocks. The energy of Blaze shattered Ermac, separating him into the many warriors who comprised his being. Now each with his own physical form, the Ermacs are linked psychically and act according to their collective consciousness. No longer a mere fusion of warrior souls, Ermac has become an army. Chameleon. The only original thing about Chameleon is his design, albeit it isn't the most interesting or creative design ever, it still looks cool though. So now is where I'm going to start bitching and moaning about characters feeling the same. He has Crane, which Shang Tsung had in Deadly Alliance and someone else had in Deception, I can't remember right now. He has Ninja Sword. All of his special moves are also just borrowed from other characters. Really boring and not unique as a character. I made it to Blaze though, so I don't like him from lack of skill, I don't like him because of lack of originality. As the battle raged, Chameleon camouflaged himself and raced to the top of the pyramid unseen. There he defeated Blaze and the ethereal power overtook him. Immortality was now his. Though he had been ever-present throughout the crises of the realms, from Liu Kang's first victory to the return of the Dragon King, he had remained hidden from sight, waiting for his moment to come. That moment had arrived. From this day forth, the realms will know Chameleon 
as the true champion of Mortal Kombat. Noob. Noob isn't a bad character, just not a very inspired one. His special moves are fine. His hammer is fun, though. His design is very meh, just a completely blacked out ninja character. Not much else to say about him. With a flash, Blaze was defeated, and Noob Saibot found he was no longer standing atop the ancient pyramid, but in the center of a darkened arena. From the shadows, a figure slowly emerged. It was Sub-Zero. The warrior Noob had been before being slain by Scorpion. Sub-Zero had come to regain control of their divided soul. The two clashed, but neither could best the other. In the end, what emerged was a being that was neither Noob Saibot nor Sub-Zero, but something new. Smoke. His design is cool, but the same as in Deception because of fucking course it is. His moves aren't anything too special, but I do like his stinky fingers move because the name is funny. He doesn't have any weapon though, which is a little odd and even a little disappointing. Smoke's power lies in his nanobot technology. Microscopic machines course through his veins, constantly repairing and altering his being. But when infused with the power of Blaze, his nanobots took on a life of their own. Multiplying at an exponential rate, they were soon numerous enough to consume Adenia, transforming the entire realm into a mass of sentient gray material that calls itself smoke. Cyrax. Nothing to say about his design, nothing fucking changed. His moves also haven't fucking changed. You could refer back to the video in which I talk about him, but I'll save you the time. He's cool and fun to play, but he feels gutted in this game. I don't know. When he defeated Blaze, elemental powers surged through Cyrax and shattered his cybernetics. He was human once again. He allied with Sub-Zero, and with him confronted the cyborg Smoke and Sector. In an epic battle of men versus machines, Cyrax and Sub-Zero defeated their longtime foes. The cyborgs will be reprogrammed to serve the Lin Kuei once more, until they too can be reverted to their human forms. Sector, one of the few cyborgs made by the Lin Kuei, and he got corrupted. He becomes a bigger threat to everyone. Nothing much to say, he's cool. Upon defeating Blaze, the power that surged through Sector linked him with his fellow cybernetic ninjas, Smoke and Cyrax. Becoming one mind, they were joined in an abomination of flesh and technology. The realms will soon tremble at the coming transformation. All will bow to the new god. Striker, leader of the NYPD Special Riot Division, he's called to save Earthrealm and he doesn't know why. Striker's pretty solid, he does steal Jax's gun move though, which is a little lame, and his grenades don't do too much for me. He just plays like a default ass character, honestly. The fire of Blaze burned away Striker's previous notion of justice. The power coursing through his soul inspired him to fight injustice on his own terms. No longer would he allow himself to be confined by the law. He would strike evil from the shadows, a vigilante who would show no mercy to the corrupt. He went into seclusion to prepare for his one-man assault on the wicked. Soon all the realms will know the name Striker. Cabal. His design is cool, as it always is, however, he does feel a little underwhelming. He doesn't have very many special moves and his hook swords honestly just don't feel good, which sucks because they look fucking badass, I mean look at these things, come on, but yeah, he's just not as great to me as he once was. The heat of blaze wrapped itself around Cabal's hook swords and transformed them into fiery blades of vengeance. Crossing them above his head, Cabal challenged Movado atop the pyramid, seeking to end their rivalry once and for all. In an epic hook sword battle, Movado could not withstand the fury of Cabal and his enhanced weapons. Never one to admit defeat, Movado took his own life by performing Harakiri. Standing atop the pyramid, Cabal raised Movado's severed head high so all would know of the Black Dragon Clan's superiority. Dairu. 
He used to be part of the Satan Guard, but his family got murdered, so we killed an innocent guy, and now he's a mercenary. Look at this guy. Bro needs Rogaine. His barber fucked him up real bad. He's not very fun to play, but his sword's fine. His design just looks goofy. The fire of Blaze enveloped Dairu and formed around him a golden suit of armor. Enraged, Shao Kahn attacked, but the armor scorched his body with every blow. Dairu defeated the Emperor and claimed Outworld for himself. Under his rule, Outworld once again became the majestic realm it had been in ages past. Convinced of his good nature, Adenia and Earthrealm forged an alliance with Dairu that would ensure peace and stability forever. Jarek. He was believed to be the last member of the Black Dragon, he fled to Adenia, and when Shinnok came to take over, he decided that he had to team up with Jax and Sonya in order to protect himself. Jarek's design isn't anything great in this game, but his axe is pretty fun to use, so I'll give him that. Otherwise though, he's fast and pretty average. His moves are kinda weird though. The power of Blaze drew Chi from all the combatants and funneled it into Jarek. He suddenly felt as if death itself were guiding his actions. Laughing maniacally, he sealed off the crater and unleashed a storm of fatalities upon his fellow warriors. None could escape the maelstrom of deadly energy. When at last the tempest abated, Sub-Zero's spine lay quivering next to Kano's still beating heart. An armless Jax knelt beside the two halves of Kung Lao's body. Jaren had finished them all. Darius. His design is cool, and there really isn't much to add on to from Deception. He plays fine, and he's cool enough, I guess. Upon defeating Blaze, the pyramid shrank and transformed into a golden ring. The ring granted Darius access to my vault, wherein lay the treasure rightfully due my sons Taven and Dagon. The powerful artifacts allowed Darius to finally defeat Hotaru and conquer the Realm of Order but the items were meant only for my lineage to wield. I have now sent Taven and Dagon on yet another quest. They must work together to defeat Darius and retrieve what he has stolen. Raiko. He was a general for Shao Kahn and Shinnok. He's a great fighter, but not much else is known about him. I mean, his design is all right. His moves are pretty standard shit. Some shurikens, a charge move, a teleport grab. I mean, nothing crazy. His weapon is a hammer, and all of the combos are only in the air, which also kind of sucks. Such a whatever character. When the godlike power of Blaze flashed through Reiko's body, he felt his old desire for power return more intensely than ever before. Now more powerful than even Shao Kahn, Reiko defeated the Emperor and claimed his helmet. As he placed it on his head, his body fused with it, transforming him into a warlord of unprecedented savagery. Fujin. Fujin replaced Raiden as the protector of Earthrealm. Fujin is honestly pretty fun. His design is pretty whatever, but his moves are actually a little unique, all utilizing tornadoes since he's the wind god after all. His sword's fun to use, and his regular stance is cool as well. I made it all the way to Blaze and almost beat the game, but didn't quite get there. As the energy of Blaze coursed through Fujin, it transformed the Wind God into a storm of justice. His power increased exponentially. He created a new realm from the shattered remnants of worlds that had fallen victim to Shao Kahn's aggression. From there, the forces of light will stage their operations, with Kung Lao as Fujin's commanding general. Bo Raicho. I still enjoy Bo Raicho in this game. I could be mistaken, but I think all of his moves are borrowed from the previous games. It's not necessarily a bad thing that they choose to do that, but it just feels kind of lazy that he's literally just the same guy with the same skin and everything. Upon defeating Blaze, Boraicho was transported to the heavens. He stood before me, a humble warrior unsure of his fate in the presence of a god. I had looked into his soul and found that he was a good man and a powerful warrior. Outworld needed a protector, a task for which Boraicho had more than proven himself worthy. At my request, the Elder Gods breathed their life force into him, transforming the once humble warrior into a god. 
Borecho had become protector of Outworld. Mavado. Mavado was the leader of the Red Dragon and hates his rivals, the Black Dragon. That is his only notable character trait. Man, come on. Mavado has the same weapon as Cabal with no difference. He has negative drip. As Lit stepped out of my livestream chat highlighted, he has a coat with one arm, his pants are up super high, and he just now bought the new Jordan Drill Bit 4s. Not only that, I just don't like Mavado. He's a nothing character to me. Not very fun or unique to play as either. Mavado felt the fire of Blaze awaken something within him. Focusing his mind, he found he could control anyone bearing the Red Dragon symbol. Telepathically guiding his clan in battle, Movado quickly subdued the special forces and the Black Dragon clan. He then tattooed their faces with the mark of the Red Dragon so they too would serve him. As his forces grew, Movado gained full control of Earthrealm. Hotaru. I actually really enjoy Hotaru's gameplay in this game. His design is the same as Deception, so he still isn't super recognizable, but he's fun to play. I like his flame ball that pops up your foe a lot, and the staff is decently fun to use. The power of Blaze transformed Hotaru into a being of pure order. All would bow before him or be transformed by his gaze. Yet there was one whom Hotaru would see pay for his crimes against conformity. The Cleric of Chaos, Havoc. The light of Hotaru poured into Havoc's mind and transformed him into an agent of order. Hotaru's second in command. Nightwolf. I still really love Nightwolf. He plays exactly the fucking same as last game, which can be said for really every single goddamn returning character. Honestly, at this point in the game, I started getting bored as fuck. Too much samey shit. The power Nightwolf received from Blaze carried him to the spirit world, an existence between realms from which shamanic power originates. He became a living ghost, the ultimate shaman. Nightwolf found his ally, Liu Kang, lost in the spirit energy, and guided him back to the physical world. Nightwolf then reunited Liu Kang with his body. Mocap. I guess his story is that he was at the wrong place at the wrong time, so now he's fighting for his life. Hey, I know that he's just a stupid joke character with no personality, but he does have some charm to me. Just look at him. His moves are pretty simple, similar to Ermac, but I don't have any strong opinions on him. What sucks is he doesn't have a weapon, which feels like a missed opportunity to do some creative shit like a tripod or something. The fury of Blaze's destruction killed all those present at the final battle. Mocap was ripped apart, his soul cast into the Adenian sky. His name is taught in Adenian astronomy to this day. He is the constellation Mocap. Legends will forever tell of how the Earthrealm warrior saved Adenia from Armageddon. Johnny Cage. Geez, I'm gonna be grasping at straws for a lot of these characters. I mean, what the fuck do you want me to say? He looks the same as Deadly Alliance, like his model was just straight up ripped from it and put in this game. He plays the same. He's okay, I guess. Johnny Cage defeated Blaze, and the power of the gods rushed through him. He gained superior strength and dexterity, but more important, a new insight into his existence. With the help of Shaolin Masters, he renounced his superficial former life and became enlightened. Kano. Kano is alright, same design as I think Deadly Alliance, and his moves and weapons are the same too, pretty much. I mean, he doesn't suck or anything, but a pretty standard experience. His Kano ball is still here though, which is cool. For months, the Red Dragon had kept Kano hidden in their mountain stronghold. An unwilling test subject for a new process designed to transform humans into dragons. Kano escaped, however, before they could finish. Infused with godlike energy from Blaze, the process was rejuvenated. Kano was transformed into a black dragon human hybrid. Jax, I mean, he has the same moveset and the same look from Deadly Alliance. Can you tell I'm not enjoying myself anymore? He plays fine, I mean, seriously, what the fuck do you want me to say? When Jax absorbed the power of Blaze, the cybernetics in his arms grew and permeated his entire body. He was transformed into a full cyborg. 
he became aware of a controlling neural chip that had been implanted in his brain by Sector. Enraged, Jax defeated Sector and claimed leadership of the cyborg ninja clan, the Takunin. It is unknown if he will ever return to the Special Forces. Kai. Once upon a time, Kai was a White Lotus member, but once he finished training, he went on his self-quest for enlightenment. I actually have to hand it to Kai here, he's pretty fun to play. His moves aren't crazy unique, but it's fun enough. I like his side heel kick move a lot, honestly. Plus, his design is actually original for this game, which I can appreciate. His spiked club is also pretty fun. The power of Blaze opened Kai's mind, and he became psychically linked to the One Being. He could see the One Being's dreams, from which all of reality is formed. In deep meditation, Kai allowed his mind to wander the realms in search of knowledge. He witnessed the rise of Shao Kahn and his eventual demise at the hand of Liu Kang, the return of the Dragon King, and the final battle at the Pyramid. But when Kai looked to the future, he saw nothing. Kenshi. I mean, yeah, his model is imported again, but hey, he's fun enough to play. He gets a pass from me simply because I like him as a character. The fire of Blaze burned away the curse responsible for Kenshi's blindness. Not only was his sight restored, but he gained increased sensitivity in his other senses as well. As time went on, however, he found the sensory bombardment unbearable. Kenshi retreated to a remote mountain cavern where he remains isolated in a darkened, soundless chamber. Chujinko. Chujinko is the biggest moron in Mortal Kombat history. All of his special moves are just reused from other characters. Yeah, in Deception he gains other characters' moves, but come on. How about give some individuality to your main and very important character for fuck's sake? He plays fun, but that's just because he's a reused asset machine. The power of Blaze drew Chi from each of the combatants and fused it with Shujinko's soul. Though the battle was over, a new threat arose. One warrior now possessed the powers and abilities of them all. Shujinko went mad with power. After slaying all present, he embarked on a new quest. He would challenge the Elder Gods for control of the realms. Su Hao. Fuck you, 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 fuck you. Killed in the shockwave of Blaze's violent death, Su Hao's corrupt soul descended into the Nether Realm. As his soul began to regain a physical body, Su Hao became his true self, a demon of emptiness and desolation. Leading an Oni horde, he defeated Shinnok and his minions. He now sits upon the throne of the Netherrealm. Cobra. He was a street thug, but since he's so good at martial arts, Cabal and Kira offer him a spot in the Black Dragon Clan. Wow, Cobra has a bunch of fire moves like Fire Kick and Fireball and Fire Punch. I've never seen anything like it before in Mortal Kombat. And wow, what an inspiring design. I'm sure no other game developer has ever thought of this design in any capacity before. He couldn't possibly look exactly like the love child of two iconic characters from a competing franchise. Because of his victory over Blaze, Cobra's strength was increased a thousandfold. Emboldened. He demanded the Elder Gods declare him Lord of the Realms. They assented, but added that no Lord should be without his lady. Cobra chose Kira to rule at his side, and the Elder Gods transformed her into a goddess of death. With a kiss, Kira extinguished Cobra's life force and reduced his body to dust. Let all who would make demands of the Elder Gods beware. Create a fighter. Steel is a character that I can wholeheartedly say is the best Mortal Kombat character of all time. I mean, come on, look at this guy. He looks just like me. If you know me in real life, you'll know. This is exactly what I look like. What a glorious character with all the right moves and the fighting styles. Just wow. Whoever made this character needs their ass eaten. Taven, son of Argus, he woke up to stop Armageddon and is supposed to team up with his brother Dagon to stop it. 
Man, I really love me a good and balanced character. I mean, really, Midway outdid themselves on this one. What a perfectly well-balanced and fair character. Love this guy. My world has been ripped to pieces. I awoke in a foreign realm, forced to complete a quest set forth by my parents, Argus and Delia. This quest, though intended to save the realms, has destroyed my family. My brother Dagon became obsessed with winning the ultimate prize of full godhood and murdered our parents. And in his madness, he sought to destroy me as well. Orin and Karo, dragons loyal to our family for ages, were not spared from the curse this quest has wrought. Dagon enslaved Karo to serve his own ends. The sorcerer Quan Chi killed Orin, who was my guardian. Though I had nothing left, I was determined to complete the quest. I faced many combatants, fighting my way to the top of the pyramid until at last I alone defeated Blaze in mortal combat. The energy released by his death passed through me, granting me full godhood. The excess power then filtered through my armor and passed into the other combatants. Though this energy was to have one of two effects on them, death or annulment of their powers, a third, unforeseen outcome resulted. The quest did nothing to resolve the instability of the realms. But as protector of Adenia, I vow to stave off Armageddon until a solution can be found. Liu Kang. The former champion of Mortal Kombat, he got killed by Shang Tsung and now is a living corpse fueled by vengeance. Hey, his zombie skin is back, so that's cool, but nothing else much of note. He plays as he always has, and he's pretty decent. Little bit of a missed opportunity to not have any badass moves involving his change, but hey, Midway went bankrupt for a reason. The power released by Blaze's destruction reunited Liu Kang's body and soul. Whole once more and possessing the power of a god, he confronted Raiden, who had been corrupted by his suicide. Liu Kang reluctantly defeated his mentor in an epic clash. With consent of the Elder Gods, he replaced Raiden as protector of Earthrealm. Kung Lao. Kung Lao is pretty solid in this game. His sword is whatever, but I did like his whirlwind kick and his hat throw. I mean, he used to not be a super interesting character to me, but he's grown on me as I've been doing this series, and I like him a decent bit now. The power released by his victory over Blaze opened a portal, and Kung Lao found himself in Earthrealm hundreds of years in the past. His ancestor allowed him to enter the Mortal Kombat tournament in his stead. Kung Lao defeated Goro and won the tournament, becoming a legend. As a result, Liu Kang never competed, and Kung Lao's rivalry with him never came to be. Shang Tsung, what a big fucking surprise. He plays exactly the same as he did in Deadly Alliance. But hey, I do like him, he's fun to play, so, you know, there's that. Solid character, solid design. Empowered by the godlike energy he received from Blaze, Shang Tsung found that he could alter the forms of others. Enraged that he was denied the prize, Shao Kahn charged the sorcerer. With a gesture of his hand, Shang Tsung transformed his former master into a centaur slave. Shang Tsung had become the ruler of Outworld at last. Quan Chi. Quan Chi is a pretty normal character, I guess. Plays like the previous games, which I know that information just made you shit your pants, but it's the truth. Quan Chi has also kind of grown on me throughout the games, though. He's not too bad, but nothing crazy. The defeat of Blaze enhanced Quan Chi's already powerful sorcery beyond his imaginings. The surge of energy was so great that it shattered his medallion. In his arrogance, Quan Chi ascended from Adenia to assault the heavens. There he confronted me with the Elder Gods at my side. The quest had been an elaborate trap designed to pinpoint the true source of disruption in the realms. As punishment, Quan Chi was transformed into a Kamidogu, the very medallion he had carried with him for so many years. The Elder Gods cast the magical item back in time, at the exact point where Shinnok had first discovered it. Shinnok. 
He was an Elder God, banished to the Nether Realm when he tried to overthrow the Elder Gods. He escaped and still tries to overthrow them. I mean, his design looks like a cheap Halloween costume, he just looks like a total fucking dork. But honestly, I do like his moves. His special moves with the hand coming and grabbing your enemy is pretty cool. I like the fact that he's at least unique in this game. Shinnok had anticipated the elimination of all the combatants present at the final battle. He sent his doppelganger to aid Dagon in defeating Blaze. But with Dagon's unexplained disappearance, the false Shinnok defeated the Firespawn. The power of Blaze breathed life into him, making him as powerful as the real fallen Elder God. Shinnok must now face himself if he is to rule supreme. Raiden. He feels like Raiden, Thunder God, has a lot of Thunder moves, plays pretty okay, has the same moves as he's had in the past two games. Nothing too special about him this time around. Okay, enough. The Thunder God, Raiden, overpowered Blaze and absorbed the energy intended to transform the Sons of Argus. His strength enhanced beyond that of other gods, Raiden became a deity of unimaginable power. Releasing his fury upon the realms, he destroyed them all. None would threaten Earthrealm again. Dagon. Dagon isn't an awful character, but his moves really aren't unique enough to make him stand apart. His design is simply Evil Taven. He's cool and all, but like I said, he doesn't have anything to make him stand out. Wounded, Dagon followed Taven to the pyramid. As Taven battled Blaze, Dagon stabbed the fire elemental from behind with a sword I had left him. Thus through treachery did Dagon complete the quest. But before he could savor his victory, the pyramid shook and a recess opened, revealing the parents he had murdered, Delia and myself. We were in fact still alive, our deaths feigned in an elaborate test created to reveal the true nature of our sons. It is clear that Taven possesses the virtue required to defend Adenia. He will take my place as defender. Dagon, however, will be punished severely for the suffering he has caused. Sonia. Wow, look, she has the same design as Deadly Alliance. Oh, and she has the same moves? Well, I'll be. They really outdid themselves. I'll give it to her, though. She is pretty fun in this game. Her Kali sticks are simple and effective, her fighting style is snappy and satisfying, and her special moves are uninspired, but at least they're fun and good. As reward for her victory, Blaze offered Sonya any power she desired. Glowing with energy, she turned and faced Kano, who had just reached the top of the pyramid. Her gaze burned into Kano. With a final scream of agony, Sonya's nemesis exploded in a cloud of ash. A mere glance, and her wish had been granted. Kano lived no more. With this new power, she incinerated the remaining members of the Black Dragon and Red Dragon clans, clearing the way for a new era of peace. Katana. Despite also being a reused asset, she plays pretty good in this game. Her design is boring as fuck, but her moves are cool. Her iconic steel fans are always a staple, and they get bonus points for including my name, so that's cool. She has some classic moves and some more modern ones as well. Absorbing the power of Blaze, Katana attained a psychic connection with the Elder Gods and became their champion. To preserve the integrity of the realms, she formed an all-female fighting force whose members included Sindel, Jade, Sonya, and Li Mei. Together, they laid waste to the forces of darkness and trapped them in the Netherrealm forever. Melina. She's actually pretty fun too. Her weapon is cool, her design is decent, and a lot of her moves are pretty fun. Overall, good character. Nothing else to say. For an instant, the power of Blaze united Melina and Katana. When the energy dissipated, Melina had become beautiful, but Katana was horrified to find her mouth filled with elongated, razor-sharp teeth. The change in her appearance allowed Melina to pose as Katana and finally take her rightful place on the throne of Adenia. She imprisoned Katana, who went mad in the palace dungeon. Jade. 
Jade is also pretty good in this game. I like her staff a lot and her special moves are fun and kind of cool looking. I'm actually surprised with how much fun I had as her, but I think her staff might be a little unbalanced. Defeated, Blaze transferred godlike power to Jade and instructed her to make true that which she most desired. As if controlled by some divine force, she let out a tremendous shriek that split open the pyramid. As she inhaled, the forces of darkness were sucked inside the ancient structure. It then resealed itself, trapping them there for eternity. Jade was celebrated as a hero, and the pyramid stood as a reminder to those who would threaten Adenia. Ashra. Well shit, I like Ashra too. Her Chris weapon is a lot of fun to use, like honestly, just really great. Her design is whatever to me though. I will say she does stand out a bit. I'd say she's grown on me since Deception for sure. The power of Blaze purified Ashra completely. She was transformed into a being of divine light. Her radiance soothed even the darkest of souls. With new purpose, she traversed the realms in search of evil, pacifying the wicked. Her mission came full circle when at last she purified the sorcerer who would have her slain, Quan Chi. Li Mei. She wanted to free her enslaved people, Xu Jingo trained her, and now she battles for all of the enslaved people. Her gameplay isn't that bad, but man, they should just rename her to Li Mid. She is just such a filler character to me. I really just don't give a shit about her, like honestly, I just don't. Play's fine though, alright. Filled with the energy of Blaze, Li Mei had but one purpose for her newfound power. In retribution for slaying her people, she banished the souls of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung to an obelisk. Trapped inside the relic, they must fend off wave after wave of aggressors for eternity. Justice has finally been done. Tanya. Tanya is actually pretty good. None of her moves are super unique or interesting, neither is her weapon, but her gameplay is alright. Yet another Ryu skin and character. Nothing new. The fire of Blaze transformed Tanya into a being known as a Dragon Caller. With a mere thought, she was able to summon dragon spirits from the ether into corporeal form. With an army of dragons at her command, she conquered the universe realm by realm. Soon Shao Kahn himself would call her Master. Frost, a student of Sub-Zero, she's good at having ice powers, but she lets it get to her head. Frost isn't horrible, but I don't think I'll ever be able to get over the fact that she just took Sub-Zero's moves and plays largely the same as Sub-Zero. Plus, she's another reused character, so it's a reused character on top of a clone. Don't like her much. Her strength increased. Frost once again took the Dragon Medallion from Sub-Zero and enhanced her freezing power far beyond her former mentors. Traveling to Outworld, she located the tomb of her ancestors, the Cryomancers, and planted their souls in the bodies of the current Lin Kuei. Her army of Cryomancers conquered the realms, leaving each of them a frozen wasteland. Sindel. Sindel honestly kind of sucks in this game, not a big fan, nothing too special about her moves, I mean I just don't get why they didn't do some kind of move with her hair, but whatever I guess. With the power of a god coursing through her, Sindel chose to undo the murder of her husband Jared at the hands of Shao Kahn. Reaching into the heavens, she pulled his soul back to Edenia and made him flesh once more. The reunited Jared, Sindel, and Katana formed the Triad of the Just to protect the realms from tyrants like Shao Kahn. Natara. She's a vampire, wants to keep her home independent, it was fused with Outworld, now she's trying to maintain its stability. I mean, her design is unchanged as usual, and so are her moves, but she didn't even get a new move or anything tweaked, and honestly, her moves are lame as fuck. She has an evade, two blood split attacks, like are you kidding me? They could have done so much more with her moveset, yet they didn't, and that's just shitty. The gift of godlike power transformed Natara into a blood god. Horrified, the combatants fled from the pyramid, but none were spared her wrath. Beginning with Shao Kahn, she mutated each of them into her vampire slaves. 
with the most powerful warriors in the universe at her command, Natara and her unstoppable army easily conquered the realms. Kira. Kira is a stupid ass character. One of her special moves is literally just Kano Ball, and her other two are moves that Sonya has had forever. I mean, what the hell is up with that? Come on. Kira defeated Blaze and attained divine power. But in the battle, Cobra had been slain. Kira channeled her newfound energy into Cobra's body, slowly returning him to life. As Cobra regained consciousness, he reveled in the surge of godlike power and prevented Kira from severing their bond. Cobra devoured her life force and stole the prize, becoming immortal. He felt no shame in his betrayal. Kira was weak. She should have left him dead. That is the Black Dragon way. Serena. She was working for Quan Chi, but then joined Sub-Zero and was banished to the Nether Realm, got freed, and is still best buds with Sub-Zero. Honestly, I didn't really have any high expectations for Serena, but she's actually pretty fun. Her moves feel unique enough, her design isn't anything crazy, but you know, that's fine. All that matters is she is original and fun to play. Blaze had dissipated, but the power he had released flowed into Serena. She lay unconscious atop the pyramid until Sub-Zero revived her. Examining her hands, she found that she had gained the ability to freeze. Serena confronted her old master, Quan Chi, and froze him solid. She and Sub-Zero hid the sorcerer in the Lin Kuei Temple, where he will remain forever suspended in a block of ice. Shiva, female Shokan who used to protect Sindel. She's just as powerful as Goro and Kentaro. This is Shiva's only appearance in the 3D era, and you know what? She's pretty fun. Her moves are basically like Goro, but that's alright. She's honestly fucking broken as hell. Super powerful. At the moment of victory over Blaze, Shiva was blinded by a flash of energy. When she regained her sight, she found herself standing before the Elder Gods. They were clearly alarmed that neither Taven nor Dagon had completed the quest. Their desire to prevent further turmoil prompted them to transform Shiva into a goddess of destruction. One by one, she laid waste to the realms using a powerful Kamidogu. When the realms reformed, nothing was as it had been. Baraka. God, I love playing as Baraka, my husband. Just look at this sexy man. I want him to spread With the power of Blaze within him, Baraka would never again serve another. Summoning Shao Kahn and Onaga before him atop the pyramid, he gave them a choice. Submit to Lord Baraka or die. They responded by attacking the Tarkatan. In a flash, Baraka's blades grew to twice their normal length and pierced his former masters through their hearts. Flinging their bodies down the side of the pyramid, Baraka turned his attention to a more important matter. Who would be his queen? He gave Melina a choice. She chose wisely. Motaro. He was the leader of Shao Kahn's extermination squads and has killed many combatants trying to kill Shao Kahn and he will continue to do that. Motaro was just a big boss guy. However, he was butchered. Man, like, what? He's just a normal guy with, with horse legs with no weapon and only a couple of special moves. Lame. Flames lashed at Motaro's body as Blaze released his energy. The searing pain consumed Motaro as he staggered about the top of the pyramid. When at last the fire dissipated, Motaro felt the familiar sensation of walking on four legs. He had undone the curse that had transformed his centaur race into minotaurs. With renewed purpose, Motaro vowed that the Shokan would pay dearly for their treachery. Havoc. Havoc hates order and wants to bring chaos to everything. Yeah, I mean, he's the same as before, but I do like Havoc. He's pretty nasty and I think that's awesome. His moves are fun and satisfying and his design is badass. Infused with the power of Blaze, the Cleric of Chaos, Havoc, became Chaos Incarnate. His aura corrupted the stability of the realms, causing them to rip, tear, and reshape in grotesque ways. 
Soon, nothing remained that resembled the former universe. Havoc's dream had been realized. Ultimate chaos had been achieved. Draman. He's an Oni who's good buddies with Moloch. He torments people in the Nether Realm. Draman is fucking nasty, but that's awesome. He's a gross guy, but it's cool. I don't like how it's just the same character as he has been before. I love him, but man, I just can't stand all the reused content in this game. The energy of Blaze unlocked the life force residing within Draman's mask. Unable to remove it, Draman became possessed by it and grew to three times his original size. The power of the mask also fueled the rage within him. Unable to contain his fury, Draman turned on his former ally, Moloch, in an epic battle of demons. Moloch was defeated, but Draman's bloodlust has only just begun. Moloch. He's just a big, beefy, oni brute who loves to cause pain to people. I like playing as Moloch because he's very, very overpowered, although it does kind of suck that half of his moves are just taunts. His design is awesome and scary, which fits his power. Cool character. The oni destroyer Moloch absorbed the gift of godlike power from Blaze and was transformed into a destroyer of worlds. In a gesture symbolic of his new power, he slammed his fist against the pyramid, completely shattering the structure. Moloch then laid waste to Adenia, transforming it into a barren wasteland not unlike the Netherrealm. Because he destroyed the Adenian portals, however, Moloch was trapped there, a victim of his own destructive rage. Meat. You know, Meat gets a lot of shit, and I honestly think that it's unwarranted. I think he's pretty cool. Yeah, his design is simple, but I don't see a problem with that. His cleaver weapon is pretty fun and cool, his head roll special move is hilarious. He pulls on his eyeball for a taunt, I mean, come on, like what is not to love? I want more wacky characters in Mortal Kombat. Honestly, I don't think the game should take itself too seriously, and characters like this are really cool in my opinion. I mean, look at him on the roster, he just kind of fits in there and doesn't blend. Meat was an experiment who escaped Shang Tsung's flesh pits before he could be completely formed. As the other combatants fought, Meat rushed unseen to the top of the pyramid and defeated Blaze. Godlike energy enveloped him, giving him the power to shapeshift. With the ability to become anyone, Meat lost his sense of identity and disappeared into obscurity. Shao Kahn. Fuck man, Shao Kahn is actually really fun in this game. He actually has a proper moveset and weapon, which isn't how boss characters usually are in these games, so I like it. He's just really scary and huge and badass. Blaze was no match for Shao Kahn the Conqueror. His strength increased tenfold. The forces of light could not fend off his final invasion as he merged each realm with Outworld. But his ultimate triumph was soon to be his downfall. With nothing left to conquer, Shao Kahn was driven to madness. Goro. Goro is the same story as Shao Kahn, plays like a character that actually has depth and feels like he fits in the roster. This poses a question though, why didn't Moloch or Motaro get the same treatment? I mean, they did it for Goro and Shao Kahn, so why not? It could have made them much better, but whatever. Goro is pretty fun and unique, honestly. Having defeated Blaze, Goro had attained the power of a god. But to the forces of darkness, this power was not meant for a mere Shokan to wield. Shang Tsung, Quan Chi, Shao Kahn, and Onaga all had anticipated victory, only to have it stolen from them. The four surrounded Goro in a vain attempt to wrest the power from him. Goro laughed, raised his arms, and let forth an ancient Shokan battle cry. From out of nowhere, an army of Shokan warriors stormed the pyramid and slaughtered the four attackers. The Shokan race will rule Outworld forever. Kintaro. Kintaro is a Shokan who has served Shao Kahn for many years. Wow, it's actually refreshing to see a boss character get some depth. It's nothing special though. Goro, Shiva, and Kintaro all kinda samey with similar movesets. I will say though, my favorite is Kintaro off of design alone. 
Upon defeating Blaze, a thunderous voice offered Kentaro four magic swords. Each would be infused with the power of any warrior of his choosing. Kentaro resolved to give the weapons the powers of fire, ice, chaos, and order. As if wielded by invisible hands, each blade found its victim and slew him. The vanquished souls were transferred to the weapons, and there they will reside. With the powers of Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Havoc, and Hotaru at his command, none will challenge Kentaro and live. Onaga. Outworld used to be controlled by him, and now he's trying to regain control of it. Onaga didn't get the treatment. Come on, man, he's just super OP. His design is really cool, but his moves are dumb as hell, and he's just way too powerful. Like, I don't care about him, I'm sorry, but I don't, and I used to love him when I was a kid. But now I'm taking my rose-tinted glasses off, and man, he's just such a nothing character. The forces of darkness defeated Blaze, and the Dragon King seized the prize for himself, attaining ultimate power. He immediately focused his wrath upon the one being he despised most, Shao Kahn. Long ago, Shao Kahn had stolen Outworld from him. Now, Onaga would repay that treachery. Shao Kahn was beaten to the point of death, but Onaga would not see him die so quickly. He ordered Quan Chi and Shang Tsung to deal with the former emperor. While Onaga reclaimed his throne, Shao Kahn remained a captive in his own dungeon, tortured by those who had once pledged to him their allegiance. Blaze. He's watched over the realms for a long time, and now he has to wake up Taven and Dagon to stop Armageddon. Blaze is fucking huge, and also didn't get the same treatment as the other bosses. Like, man, he's the main villain of this game, and he didn't get a good moveset? I mean, you've gotta be fucking kidding me right now. That's just so dumb. Why not? During his ages-long quest to monitor the realms, Blaze had been enslaved by Onaga's holy men and forced to guard the Great Dragon Egg. The spell used to control him corrupted his original design. When his final objective atop the pyramid came to pass, he was unstoppable and defeated all who challenged him. As foreseen by the sorceress Delia, Armageddon began in the Adenian Crater and spread throughout the realms, shattering reality until there was nothing. I'm not even going to waste any more of your time. Mortal Kombat Armageddon is a game that has far too much reused content that is just so painfully mid. No, the game isn't bad by any means. If this is the only one that you played of the original 3D trilogy, then that's great. Then you're really just getting a best of compilation. But for someone like me who's actually playing through these games one by one, it's just a reused asset machine. Like, it's just nothing to me. And it can get really boring. Most of the characters are just straight up ported from previous games, as are a lot of the maps, and the new characters just feel like clones. Really, many of the characters in general feel way too similar to justify such a large roster. Motor combat doesn't suck exactly, but it gets old very quick. Honestly, the best part of the game is conquest mode. The crypt also isn't as cool as previous games. Anyways, I love this game as a kid, so it hurts to say it, but this game gets a 5 out of 10. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video in any capacity, consider subscribing. I'm gonna do more Mortal Kombat videos. I'm gonna do probably a Tony Hawk series. I wanna revisit Assassin's Creed. I wanna do a Grand Theft Auto series. I mean, just for a while here, I wanna just make content and uh, have fun doing it. So I really hope you enjoyed and um, have a good day.